with the theme ASEAN Diversities and its Principles Toward ASEAN Legal Integration in Pandemic Era. The first International Conference on Law and Human Rights, or ICLHR 2021, is organized by the Faculty of Law Universitas Kristen Indonesia in collaboration with Hans Seidel Foundation and Ministry of Law and Human Rights of the Republic of Indonesia, co-organized by Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan and Universitas Jayabaya. My name is Herto Bastian Abul, and I am still your Master of Ceremony for this international conference. This conference is also available on YouTube channel, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Kristen Indonesia. So if you want to keep up with day one and even want to uh, repeat watching the day two of this conference, you can go to YouTube channel, Fakultas Hukum Universitas Kristen Indonesia. And for those who need translation, you can use interpreter feature on Zoom by going to the lower right corner if you're using PC or laptop, or if you're using mobile phone, you can simply go to settings and find more. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us start this conference with an opening prayer led by Ms. Jessica Vincencia Marpaung, SHLLM. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let us pray to God Almighty to get the second day of conference. Kindly allow me to lead in Christian faith. And if you may, please pray along according to your faith. Let us pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you as only through your guidance and by your grace only, we were able to arrange and hold a smooth sailing first day conference yesterday, gathering both our national and international colleagues to have a productive discussion. Lord, we pray that you bless this second day conference from start to finish so that we may teach and learn from each other so that the exchanges of ideas facilitated by this conference would lead to a better understanding of human rights protection by the law. Guide the committee, the speakers, and all participants so that we may speak and listen with attentiveness, critical thinking, and humility, and may this conference bring about forged friendship and increased quality of education. Father, we lift this imperfect prayer to you so that you may perfect it and bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Marpaung. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will continue with parallel session in the respective rooms from 9 a.m. to noon or at uh, 12 p.m. And after lunch break, we will continue with the plenary sessions. And for your information, there will be three Zoom rooms available in today's parallel session, respectively speaking about economic law, civil law, public policy and politics, human rights, and international law. And uh, I think I, we need to share this with you. The presenters must be in the assigned room, while participants may choose any room in accordance with your preference. And the link is available uh, on Zoom chat room, or you can find it on WhatsApp group, or you can simply log on to www.iclhruki.com to find uh, the link. And spe especially for room three, where you will be speaking about economic law, you don't need to change a room because this main hall room is going to be the room where you will be speaking about economic law. I think that's all for now. Have a nice uh, session, everyone, and see you at one. And any more information from the committee? Yep, after parallel session, we will have a keynote uh, speech session, and also we will have a plenary session. And we, re we hope that everyone will be back to main room and then we will have more interesting topic to talk about. Until then, have a nice day.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure uh, is my friend here uh, participating for the economic law. Okay, so I think we need to start, right? Yes, Miss. Okay. Yes, Miss Dukila. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, all the participants, presenters. Uh, welcome to the parallel session, second day of the International Conference uh, on Law and Human Rights 2021. Uh, with the dense uh, ASEAN diversities and its principles towards ASEAN legal integration in pandemic era organized by Indonesian Christian University. I would like to say happy fasting for Muslim friends who are celebrating fasting, hopefully blessings. I'm Nukila Evanti, a moderator of this parallel session. I'm the advisory board of Asia Center, Bangkok, Thailand, and visiting lecturer uh, at several universities. In this session, we had uh, 11 speakers who will speak on economic laws. Uh, the issues to be discussed are very relevant according uh, AEC, ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint 2025, that should be supported by legal regulations. Therefore, ASEAN countries need to be encouraged to make responsive, effective, avision, non-discriminatory, and pro-competition regulations that are adjusted uh, uh, AEC Blueprint 2025. Uh, this means that each ASEAN country needs to harmonize regulations so that the rules that apply in each national territory do not conflict with each other and in line with uh, AEC Blueprint 2025. Uh, Since our timing is very tight, I will start inviting the speakers to presentations for uh, two presentations. For the first speaker uh, is, uh, let me check my computer. For the first speaker uh, is Reanji Franciscus Tegulu. Uh, with the title Notary PPAT Liability Binding Deed for Sale and Buy Heritage Land, Studi Putusan Number 23, uh, PDT G 2015, PNGST. So I would like to give the time for uh, Reanji. Your time is five um, minutes, right? Okay, time is yours. Thank you, moderator. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the chance that given to me. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Reanji Franciscus Tatanafa Gula. Now, I want to present my PowerPoint with the topic Notary or PPIT, Liability Binding Deed for Sale and by Heritage Land Study Putusan number 23 PDT.G 215 2015 PN.GST Abstract In maintaining the professionalism of a notary a notary who commit a violation can be given a sanction as a form of responsibility, but a lawsuit can also be filed by the parties who have suffered loss, losses. This study was, I meet 
at analyzing the role, authority and responsibility of the notary on the making of the sale and purchase deed to analyze analyze the Mr. result. Mr. do you have your presentation, a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Can you share it? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Abstract to to analyze the sanction against the notary and juridical responsibility for sale and purchase deed that has been is. Issued the research research so that the sale and purchase agreement did number 41 that April 21st 2010 between GK and PG met by and before the notary SA is legal disability and any transfer of right the, to the object of the ECO Visma dispute. So Liga has no binding legal force, notary SA, who, who was suspected of having violated the code of ethic and had not given any sanction. Problem based on the description above, the definition of the problem can be take, taken as the rule, authority and responsibility of the notary for the making of the sale and purchase deed, especially the deed for the sale and purchase of inherited land in Gunung Stoli, North Sumatra province. How is the decision of the panel of judges at the Gunung Stoli District Court, Medan High Court decision and the decision of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Indonesia? in relation to the sale and purchase agreement date number 41 that of april 21st 2010 sanction that can be given to the notary if uh, if he violate the code of ethic or juridical responsibility for the sale and purchase did the he has ensued, but does not have binding legal force. Research method. The type of research used is juridical empirical research. The nature of this research is descriptive analysis. The data collection technique was carried out by conducting fire the research with information interview technique by directly asking respondent who had been previously determined. Data analysis in this study use qualitative method. This, this discussion that is 
authorities and responsibility of a notary or PPAT in is issuing a land sale and purchase deed in Indonesia. Notary public must act honestly, be careful, independently, do not take side, safeguard the interest of related parties. Based on other laws and based on Article 15 UUGN number 30 of 2004 in conjunction with UUGN number 2 of 2014. 14, the authority of the notary. Making authority authentic deeds regarding all action, agreement and stipulation required by statutory regulation. Gu guarantee the certainty of the deed creation that keep the deed, provide grossy co copy and ex escape of the deed. Ratify the signature and set a certain date of the letter. Book the letter under the hand by registering in a special book. Make a copy of the original letter under hand. Verify the com compatibility of the photocopy with the original letter. Angie, yeah. I apologize. You have two minutes. More. Pro providing legal counseling, make, making it relating to land, making it of option minute. Sanction. Sanction to notaries who feel who violate the code of ethics according to UGN. The form of legal responsibility for a notary is civil legal responsibility. When the notary makes a mistake because of broken prom promise as determined in the prov provision of Article 1243 of the civil code or Act again the law aspect specific in the provision of Article 1365 of the Civil Code. The, in, the impossible of criminal sanction, again, a notary can be carried out as long as the limit as set in the criminal code are violated. Best based on the result of the others interview with the judges and public relation at the district court that this this put is true of interim in problems. PG claimed that Wisma Soliga was his before G key. Did did PG did not escape the statement meanwhile the, the the decision of the supreme court ordered the inherited inheritance to be div divided into three to at here here in making the sale and purchase agreement did the supreme court state the that and any transfer of rights to the object of the dispute a co with Masoliga is legally fluid and has no binding legal force.
it can be said the not that that the notary SA concerned is suspected of violating that code of ethic, but has not given any sanction to the notary public. Conclusion: The authority and responsibility of a notary as a general official, namely, must act honestly, thoroughly, independently, and maintain the interest of the parties in full fit. Thank you, Reanji. I think yeah. the time is up now. Yep. So, That's okay. My PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Some important uh, things that uh, can be noted uh, from Reanji presentation that the uh, notary can be sanctioned uh, in towards the law number uh, Undang-Undang Nomor 2 2014, Civil Code for violation of the criminal uh, code or for sale and for uh, purchasing deed. But there is uh, the highlighted note that uh, there is no binding legal force for uh, this uh, for these deeds. Yeah. So uh, if there is any questions uh, for ING presentation, and I will move to an, another speaker. Anyone? I think there is no question. I think. It's clear, yeah. So I, I just want to ask uh, one question for Ayanji. What made the the, the, the decision from the Supreme Court uh, say uh, there is no binding legal force? Ayanji? Yeah, Miss. With Miss White, like Miss. Hmm. Hello. Yeah, Miss. Uh, based on the result of the other interview with the judges and public relation at the district court, that this dispute is true. Of heritage problem, problem, PG claimed that Wisma Soliga was his before GQ, that VG did not escape the statement. Meanwhile, the de decision of the Supreme Court ordered the inheritance to the to be dividend, dividend into three to its hair. In making the sell and purchase agreement, did the Supreme Court state, stated that any transfer of right to the object of the dispute a co with Masoliga is legally. Bawit and has no binding legal force. It's it can be said that an, the notary SE concerned is suspected of violating the code of ethics but has not given any sanction to the notary public. Well noted. So uh, I will move to the another uh, speaker because we are running with the time. Uh, Another speaker is Mariani. Uh, she will speak about legal protection against a non binding party as warranty on transaction loans uh, online. I will give the floor to Mariani, please. Thank you, Miss. Good morning, everyone, which I respect. Mrs. Nukila Evanti as moderator, and all the presenter who I love, let me introduce myself. My name is Mariani. 
from Universitas Prima Indonesia. Today, I will presentation about my journal article, like a protection against a non-bind party as warranty on transaction loans online. Online loan transactions better known as P2P lending are a service provided by a company to the public with the aim of lending and borrowing money online through a website of application managed by the company. Online loan service provide convenience and benefits to the community because uh, no longer requires a physical meeting between the borrower and lender, but is brought together through an application or website. The advantages of lending and borrowing money through other P2P lending service are very easy terms and a fast process compared to borrowing money through bank institution. A phenomenon of online loans is in many cases violation of human rights. A guarantor who never guarantees fintech development has potential risks, consumer protection, financial system, and stability, payment system, economic system. Problem, the first one, how is the legal relationship between fintech companies, debtors, and third parties in online agreements? Second, what is the legal consequences of third parties who do not bind, who do not bind themselves as a guarantors? How is the legal protection efforts to resolve data misuse in online loans relating to non-parties have never entered into an agreement as a guarantor? Discussion, the lender can be a person or legal entity or business entire has receivable due to the information technology-based lending and borrowing service agreement. Lender came from our country or outside our country. Loan recipient can be a person, legal entity has a debt due to the information technology-based lending and borrowing service agreement originated and domiciled in the jurisdiction of Indonesia. Indonesia, individual Indonesian citizen or Indonesian legal entity online loan-based fintech service providers, Indonesian legal entities that provide, manage, and operate information technology-based lending and borrowing service. The operators must first be declared as other financial service institution in the form of legal entities, either limited liability companies or cooperatives. Third parties can be fintech companies, lender, loan recipient, bank, financial service authority, or guarantor. Legal relationship between the lender and the operator. The legal relationship is based on a, an agreement set up in an electronic document between the two parties. Legal relationship between lender, fintech company, and borrower debtor. The loan agreement is did not occur between the loan recipient and the operator. The occurs is between lender and loan recipient based on Article 1320 Civil Code. Legal relationship between the operator and the bank created by the agreement on the use of the FITO account and the escrow account as mandated by Article 24 PLJK number 17 PLJK.1 slash 2016 concerning information technology-based lending and borrowing services. Legal relationship between provider and OJK was born on the provision of the laws and regulation. In this case, PLJK number 17, PLJK.1 slash 2016, concerning information technology based lending and borrowing service, not on the basis of an agreement. Administrator who intend to run a P2P system must obtain permission from the OJK. Legal relationship between providers and third parties guarantor has no legal relationship because in online third parties loans never increase themselves in an agreement. Legal consequences for third parties who do not bind themselves as a guarantor, third party is not obligated to pay the debtor's debt because the guarantee agreement is not legally valid because there is no legal engagement and third party never binds themselves as a guarantor. Legal protection effort to resolve misuse of data in online loans related to parties who has who have never bind themselves to an agreement as guarantor, entitled, entitled to legal protection, basic principle like transparency, fair treatment, reliability, confidentiality, data security, resolution of user dispute in a fast, simple, and affordable cost. Conclusion. 
question legal relationship between fintech companies, debtors, and third parties in online agreements. Legal relationship between online loans provider and OJK from the provision of law and regulation. Law, if the third party never binds themselves as a guarantor, do not have legal consequences in terms of the right. Legal protection for third party who are not bound as guarantor can reporting financial service authority or OJK along with the evidence held by means of via email, https, slash slash consumer.ojk.go.id, complaint form, via line complaint BRTI, via Instagram can at OJK Indonesia, via Twitter at complaint content. Suggestion, the fintech company also makes an agreement in the form of an agreement with the guarantor so that a clear legal relationship will emerge between fintech and the guarantor. In addition, fintech parties are advised not to involve third parties that are not mentioned in the agreement. The government can provide more protection for fintech fixed team on the basis of law number no. eight of 1999 concerning consumer protection. Regulations are expected to address major issues such as confidentiality, security, integrity, and reliability of data present by fintech companies to the public as well as legal protection for users, users of fintech services, especially peer-to-peer -peer lending. It is hoped that the government will make the fintech law. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, I think it's great presentations here yeah, uh, regarding uh, on uh, on loan transaction is very current and uh, I, I just knew about uh, th there are so many parties involved in this online transaction fintechs operator bank lender financial service authority or OJK uh, and you are uh, propose uh, some recommendation regarding one of them is a, a need clear legal agreement between fintechs uh, uh, fintechs uh, fintechs and guarant guarant guarantor right yeah it's very interesting if there is any uh, question for the presenter please raise hand or toward the chat is there any question it's very uh, great presentation. I love it. Any? I think it's clear, yeah, Mariani. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, um, yeah. I'll move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, uh, Lamtur Romani Hutabarat uh, uh, will speak about practice of taking over the power of the board of directors with notary deed. Uh, at PT Nunut Agung Perkasa in Central Tapanuli District, North Sumatra Province. I'll give, I'll, I'll give the floor to Lamtur, please. Sorry, Miss. Lamtur is the, doesn't come because okay. uh, father in law is passed by yesterday. I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay. okay. Um, I move to the next presenter, Emmanuel Abrianto Tela, Teleum Banua. Uh, we'll speak about trouble life insurance handling effort due to the inability of policyholders to pay insurance premium at PT Asuransi BRI Life in Medan. Please, Emmanuel, time is yours. Uh, a presentation, uh, my topic is uh, trouble life insurance handling efforts due to the inability of Polish holders to pay insurance premiums at uh, Assurance Bear Life. Uh, appreciate uh, this uh, document. Are you sharing the PPT, Emmanuel? Yes, uh, I shared. Please, please wait. Okay. 
my God. Or maybe you can explain while you're sharing your uh, PPT. Yes, this uh, don't share PPT. If you don't mind, Mr. Emmanuel, I can share your PPT. Yes. Yes, please. Thank. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, introduction: It's the danger results in a lot of risk, both both uh, accidents, self, and result of the action of those this uh, no cause people to to use it. insurance service risk in insurance. Law is uh, uneven that a course, a course outside the will of the insurer, which uh, please slide to. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Insurer, the insurer are supports of uh, obligation and rights. The insurer is obliged to uh, SM the rice trans transferred to him. The is uh, intellect to receive premiums. Will the insurer is uh, obligated to pay the premium and is uh, intellect to receive uh, compensation if a loss occurs on his insured property. Uh, slide three, the premium uh, payment is the obligation of the insured person where timing and amount of the premium payment has been met and agreed upon in the police, the cycle, the insurance agreement will continue until an event that has been agreed on or has expired accords. The insurance prior is in accordance with the contents of the agreed police, but the main address here is how the Alter of uh, if the policyholders does not fulfill its obligation in in premium to the insurance. Uh, problem. Uh, how is the insurance agreement between the insur the insurance company and the customers? Uh, problem two. What are the legal consequences of inability to pay premiums? Uh, problem three. How are the efforts to handle problematic insurance die to the inability of policyholders of pay premiums at Barry Life Medan? Discussion, life and health insurance, uh, two types of insurance. Uh, the first, life and, life and health insurance. Uh, to, uh, second, property and casualty insurance. The rise of life that cannot be denied is the rise of death and the rise of living too long. If these two things happen, it will definitively affect the quality of our life and those around us a lot. Uh, next slide, I'm sorry. There are four insurance principles, insurable interest principle, the principle of indemnity. The principle of honesty uh, perfect, of, of utmost good faith, and, and the principle of subrogation to the insurance. Next slide. Based on Article uh, 255 of the Criminal Code, it can be 
consolidated that uh, that the insurance agreement can be a means of proof as a means of proof the contents of the police must be in accordance with the contents of the coverage agreement made by the uh, practice. The police is a means of proof for the inter interest of the insurer, not for the interest of the insurer in Article 246 KUHD, there is a formula by which the insurer binds himself to the insurer by receiving a premium. Based on this formula, it can be seen that premium is one of the important elements in insurance because, because it is the main obligation that must be uh, fulfilled by the insurance to the insured. If the premium is not paid, the insurance can be cancelled or at least the insurance cannot run. The premium must be paid in advance by the insured because the, the insured is a, an, an interest party. Very life ins uh, insurance products are very uh, diverse and are tailored to the life stack of a prospective customer. There are insurance products, market, truck, banking, Adobe insurance. Company employs the micro insurance uh, are some very life insurance product. Uh, this one, unit link insurance, uh, protection link unit, optimal link unit. Well, just, Emmanuel, you have only one minute left. Okay, thank you. Sorry. The national insurance term life insurance provider that believe if insurance dies within a certain period of time. Uh, consolation, next consolation, life insurance business according to the company law is a business that provider rise management service that provider payment to police holders the insurance or the intelligence parties in in the event the insurance dies or remains a leave or other payment to the police holder amount of which has been uh, determined and are based on the result of fund management article uh, 246 of the Kauhadi content as formula by which the insurance bind uh, himself to the insured by receiving premium. Based on this formula, I, it, can, it can be seen that premium is one of the important elements in insurance because it is the main obligation that must be provided the insurance, the insured, if the premium is paid, the insurance can be cancelled or at last the insurance cannot run. Suggestion. Uh, one, it's hoped that insurance customers shall pay invitation to the cash value by asking the insurance company or closing and the taking the cash value uh, immediately if they cannot pay in the future and customers are expected to read back the police obtain it because they are given time to reverse it. It is not according with the agreement. It is hoped that, that the insurance sellers force will provide clear information about the losses and benefits to the customer so that some mistakes occur. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel, uh, for uh, a good presentation. Uh, uh, this is very interesting, yeah. Because uh, I just want—I have a question for you. Uh, what if, uh, because you mentioned about that, if the insured cannot pay, or he or she inability to pay premium insurance? So this is under the. Uh, uh, criminal code, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, it can be approved uh, uh, that violation of Article uh, 2055 Criminal Code. So, does she or he can be liable for violation of criminal criminal code only, or private, uh, uh, or uh, or what uh, is is she or she can be sentenced to jail or prison? 
uh, if he cannot pay, he or she cannot pay the premium insurance. Emmanuel? Yes. So he or I'm she sorry. can, yeah, if he or she cannot pay for premium insurance, so yes. uh, uh, he or she can be sentenced to jail in prison based on criminal code or any other mediation or uh, other other mechanism. Uh, this uh, mediation and mechanism. Uh, I'm sorry, I can speak Indonesian. Yeah, sorry. The, yeah. You can speak in Bahasa Indonesia. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I think uh, that because we are running with the time, if there, uh, if there is any question from the participants? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Please, Alvindo. Okay. Uh, uh, can we bring a uh, question in Bahasa? Yes. Uh, yes. Please. Bahasa. Uh, apakah Anda bekerja di BRI Life Insurance? Uh, ya. Yeah. Uh, kalau begitu, saya mau bertanya uh, satu kasus. Misalnya, ada nasabah yang sudah masuk uh, ke dalam asuransi. Apakah seseorang yang bunuh diri itu klaimnya dibayarkan oleh pihak asuransi atau penanganannya gimana? Mungkin itu saja pertanyaannya. Uh, Terima kasih. Oke, okay. terima kasih atas pertanyaannya. Uh, terima kasih pertanyaannya, Pak. Uh, untuk uh, klaim untuk bunuh diri pada polis telah tertera untuk bunuh diri tidak bisa diklaim, Pak. Dalam polis telah tertera dalam pasal-pasal polisnya. Jadi penanganannya gimana, Pak? Apakah preminya dibalikkan semua atau gimana? Uh, biasanya, Pak, itu premi tidak dikembalikan, Pak. Karena dalam setiap asuransi itu ada nilai tunainya. Dan biasanya kalau bunuh diri itu uh, polisi tidak dikembalikan, Pak. Nilai tunainya, maaf. Oh baik, terima kasih. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Alvindo. Uh, and Emma, I'm Emmanuel. Uh, so I uh, turn to the next speaker. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, the next is Akmal Budi. He will speak about legal protection of person with disabilities in signing and affixing. Finger friends to the notary deed minutes. Please, uh, Kamal Budi, the time is yours. Akmal Budi? You have five minutes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name is Akmal Budi. Publication with title Legal Protection for Person with Disabilities in Singing and Affix Fingerprint on the Minute Deed of Notary. <laughs> Background of the problem The Republic of Indonesia has A constitutional state based on Pancasila and the 1114 of the Republic of Indonesia. With this legal certainty, order, and protection for every citizen. Apologize, Akma Budi, do you have for the PPT to share? Share. Share, Miss. You can do it by your own. Share screen, the green button. Or you want to have, uh, need some help from the committee? The committee, Sakeus, would you please share the PPT of uh, Akmal Budi? Okay, Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rahman, you can 
Akmal, you may, you may start because we are running with the time. You have only five minutes. Yeah, let, let me continue, Miss. Yes. <coughs> Background of the problem: the republics of Indonesia, as of constitutional states, basis on Pancasila and the uh, <coughs> Constitution of the Republic of Indonesia, British Legal Society. Order and protection for every citizen to ensure legal certainty, order and protection, authentic written evidence is request regarding legal attacks, agreement, decisions, and even made for made before or by on authorized official. Legal position must follow the development of people life so that they do not become rigid not only a sleeping loss or even that slow the state of indonesia as a state of law was society continues to develop in terms of science and technology has brought big changes so it's necessary to also mix Things to various regulation to harmonize people life. One of the regulation that has undergone amended is the regulation of law number thirty of two thousand for concerning the position of notary. In lieu of regulation of notary position of Starbuck number three, one on one thousand eighty hundred sixty, or regulation. Apologize, Akmal. You have only four minutes because uh, I, I've I've seen that you have twenty twenty uh, slides, yeah. So maybe you can make it more, you know, precisely with your presentation. Thank you. Problem. Problem formulation. What is the products for affixing fingers of tapers to the minutes date of notary according to law number two, twenty thousand fourteen, concerning amend to law number thirty. Twenty <coughs> concerning notary position, two thousand. Number two, what is the legal implication of application fingerprint of the parties to the minute date of the notary? Number three, how is how is the authentic? Of the notary debt in relation to person with disabilities, not singing and affixing fingerprint on the min minimum dates. Recess objective number one to analyze to analyze it and find out how the products of affixing fingers print of paper to the minute date of notary according to law number two, 2014, concerning amends to law to number 30, 2004, concerning on the position of notary public to analyze it and find 
Oh, the legal implication of effacing fingerprint of the parties to the minute this of notary. Number three, to honestly and find out the authentic of the notary deed in connection with person disabilities, not singing and affixing fingerprints on the minutes deed. The next is of Apologize, Akmabudi. Maybe you can uh, go through your findings from your research questions. Because uh, it is, uh, you have only two minutes now. Uh, let's. Your findings. Let me continue, Miss. Uh, suggestion. Number one, there is a need for a application regulation of law 2014 so that the provision of Article 17, Paragraph 1, Letter, do not cause multiple interpretation even talks the Indonesian Notary Association Organization has the meat with fingerprint must be affixed on the spread seat and exit to the minimum date. It will be even more strengthened if the government establishes further regulation in government regulation as the implementation, implementation of this law. Number two, essential the effects of the fingerprint assessment. It should be taken into consideration for the government to implement the monetary loss for anything fingerprints or authentic deep products made by others officers so as did and land did making officer or PPAT civil registry did and other authentic did number three notice as stated official who had opened open by the government should maintain a professional attack by being and implementation the regulation made for notary Recession, but the test made by the government and the Indonesian Notary Association. Organization requires the obligation to put finger spin on the minute of the notary deed in accordance with Article 16, Paragraph 1, Letter Law on Notary Position Number 2. 2014 and the notary code of it of it is Sebastian thank you miss uh, interview with Medan City notary Mr. Abidin S. Pengabian S.H. and interview with Medan City notary Miss Herina Ginting S.H. SPM Thank you, Akma Budi, for uh, good presentations. This is uh, interesting, yeah, because your your um, mentions about the this, uh, issue of disabilities uh, and uh, the lack of implementation of the law number two, two thousand fourteen. Uh, if there is any question from the floor from the participant, please raise your hand uh, or chat, please. If there is any, oh, okay, Alvindo, please. Okay, one question from for Akmal Budi. Uh, what does Nyekter can concept?
is The fingerprints are results of a finger reproduction with a debris taken imprinted with ink or max level object because they have been touched by the skin of the plate of film. The skin of the plate is the skin of the plate starting from the base of the wrist to all the tips of the fingers. And the skin of the soles of the feet from the heels, heels to the tips of the finger, where in this are uh, the uh, fine lines produced from each other, separate by gaps of growth, which from a particular stroke. Friction is to first greater friction so that the fingers can hold object either. Human fingers are used for intensification purpose because no two humans have exactly the same fingerprint. This began in the late 19th century along with the times 20th century fingers have been developed toward a security system that functions as security data. For example, fingerprint extend machines and door access control. Baby footprints are also taken at the hospital for identification of the baby. This aims to prevent the sweep, sweeping of baby that often other in hospital. Okay, thank you, Akmal Budi and Alvindo. I hope you are uh, ha uh, have a good understanding uh, from the ex uh, explanation from Akmal. I have one question to Akmal uh, regarding: Have you? Uh, conducted research to the person with disabilities. What have been their challenges uh, in, you know, in effects, um, in doing uh, or uh, meeting with the notary regarding agreement or something like that? Have you interviewed with uh, one of the person with disabilities? What are the challenges that they are facing when they, you know, have a meeting with the notary or making an agreement? Or notary did. Uh, I, I'm agreement uh, notary with a city uh, madam miss. Okay, okay, that's okay. Thank you. So uh, uh, I'll turn to the next speaker. Thank you, Akmal, for your presentation. Now turn to the next speaker. To thank you, Mr. yeah, thank you, Akmal. Uh, next speaker is Cindy. She will speak about juridical analysis of individual loan guaranteed by land rights, which shifted to authentic sale and purchase deed. Case study of the Supreme Court decision number uh, numbers 1857, 2016. Uh, I will give the floor to Cindy. Uh, Cindy. Thank you, Miss Nukaila. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the time given today. I'm Cindy. Today, I present my journal titled Juridical Analysis of Individual Loan Guarantee by Land Rights, which shift to authentic sale and purchase deed. Case study of the Supreme Court decision number 1857K slash DDD slash 2016. The pre preliminary in Article 1754, Civil Law Code mentioned loaning is an agreement where one party given 
given specific number of consumable goods due to usage. With a term where the other party will have to return the same number of goods in the same kind and condition. It has generally been described in an article 1754 Civil Law Code about loaning act if implemented in daily life. Then the act can happen in banking scope and individual scope. Usually, the debtor always give guarantee in form of moving or non-moving object for creditor to provide loans. If debtor can pay, pay back the loan, the guarantee object will be sold by the creditor. This case happened when debtor and creditor agree to make a loan and borrow money relation, and that agreement is made in presence of a notary. By the agreement of the party, a debt recognition agreement is made with a land certificate as guarantee while a separate agreement is made in the form of sale and purchase deed that hasn't accrued. When the debtor default, then creditor with the sale and purchase deed claim that the land is his house based on the sale and purchase agreement and ask the debtor to soon empty the house then do the locking. With that case, debtor feel wrong because the first intention according to the debtor is to make a loan agreement, not a sale and purchase agreement, so that the problem is supposed to be solved by resolving the loan, since debtor feel like never selling the land and the land is a guarantee with sale and purchase bending to guarantee and to assure the creditor for giving a loan to the debtor. The problem formulation in this research. The first one, how is the duly normative provision regarding loan and guarantee of land rights? Number two, how is the legality regarding loaning guarantee switching to sale and purchase object with a notary certificate? Number three, how is the necessary just legal consideration and legal certainty by the judge on Supreme Court ruling number 1857-2016 should be? The first one, the the thing that differs moving and non-moving object in the term of delivery in position. Delivery immovable object needs a formal requirement that is legally recorded while a formal object delivery is done in real. In guaranteeing the payment of debt, immovable objects such as land in the category of paying debt with special guarantee. According to Article 1, Chapter 1, the mortgage law number 4, year 1996, mortgage right Right is a land guarantee charge following other object that is one with the land for debt payment and giving prioritized position to creditor against other creditor. Charging mortgage right process is done by giving mortgage right where debtor submit to bank a land right certificate which can will be charged a mortgage right. Then the second step is to register the mortgage right basically in form of granting mortgage right certificate made before a land titles registrar, which is then registered to city land office at latest seven working days after signing. After that, the mortgage right certificate on the collateralized object along the with land right certificate. Number two, legality regarding shifting of loan guarantee to sell object with notary certificate. Shifting right of sale object land happens since the sale and purchase deed is signed before an authorized land register registrar with price is paid by the buyer to the seller. Shifting right of sale object land means transfer of control juridically and physically at once. As for legality of shifting a land guarantee is regulated in Article 20 to Article 21 mortgage law and the first way by selling with own authority. Where is it is the right for the mortgage right holder to sell the mortgage which object on his own to general option without court order when the debtor default. Selling right with own authority is the right that is given by law for the right holder through mortgage law. That reads, if debtor is breaching contract, first mortgage holder have the right to sell mortgage object on his own through option and taking the loan payment on the selling result. Second way, that can be based on the executorial title by court order. And the third way, by being done by seller under the mortgage holder as regulated in the mortgage law, Article 20, Chapter 2 and 3. The third one, justice and legality certain considered by the judge on the Supreme Court verdict analysis number 
1857 the first one, uh, when the debtor agreed to have a loan relation yeah. deal with the debtor for 150 million rupees. The agreement is put in a loan agreement and sale agreement on a house belong to debtor before a notary. After the loan is due, the debtor is unable to pay the debt. The creditor confiscates the <laughs> debtor house by locking and declare that the house has been house saved to, on the basis of the sales agreement. In the court fact outline by debtor has made an effort to offer the house to other party to pay his debt to creditors and almost bought by the other party amounting 250 million rupiah. And from the selling outcome, the remain debt by debtor to the creditor, creditor will be paid. But the creditor quite oppositely disagree with the seller. On that matter, debtor then sued creditor on the agreement and action against the law and deceive because the initial intention is loan, not sale. The conclusion, uh, no, sorry. This is number three, still number three, from justice side. The set, two parties did from the justice side indeed the debtor as a lender had to return the money, money as well. It is something fair for creditor when debtor give his land certificate to creditor. If you look at the judge's consideration in this case, it doesn't consider that two-party case from procedure side, loan mechanism and sale agreement. But the judge considered the object that is dispute, namely a land or house creditor got from debitor. Therefore, justice here is created for creditor by having and dominating land based on sale certificate, but it's become unfair to debtor because procedurally, the desire of land sale is the done. Uh, yeah. You have only one minute. Okay, miss. Uh, I, I go to the conclusion. The first one, practically, loan of creditor both immutable or legality in that is, as lender is always asking for a guarantee. The most common guarantee is a land property right, where the normative provision of binding land property right is ruled in the special law, namely uh, mortgage law number four, where mortgage law is guarantee of charged land, including other things that is one with the land for debt payment by giving prioritized position to certain creditor to other creditors. Number two, legality of sifting loan guarantee to become a sale object is not right because there is no correlation or relation to one another. Sifting loan guarantee happens by referring to legal rules specialized about guarantee, one of which two immovable object then has to refer to a mortgage law. Shifting loan guarantee happen if the debtor in default and when default is shifting guarantee to creditor will also go through the step of executing the immovable object guarantee according to the law ruling it. According to CPL law code in article 1458, ruling sale is done fairly and in case the sale implement ought to be done at the time and can be done by before a notary and a land title registrar so that between guarantee object becoming sale object got no relation at all so it can be done. Number three, legal consideration from the justice and legal certainty set by court judge at the cassation level supposed to consider the legal fact about two legal at loan with a land or house guarantee becoming sales that's supposed to be prohibited. And it's against the legal rule so that based on the legal fact, judge is supposed to give consideration from both justice and legal certainty where the loan dispute resolution is First, clarified by asking the own part, the debtor pay the debt following the interest and the lending party to creditor, accepting the remain payment following the interest. Uh, that's the end of my present presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for interesting and good presentation. Uh, that uh, uh, mostly I I. Uh, uh, take some notes regarding shifting right. You mentioned uh, a lot about shifting right of sales, objected land, uh, legality of shifting law uh, that uh, already like regulated uh, in mortgage law. So that's very interesting. Uh, and I would like to uh, give the floor if there is some question to Cindy or raise hand. Or toward the chat. Yeah. We have um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ranji. Uh, 
Is the sale and purchase agreement on the basic of loan valid? If the debtor default. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ranji. Uh, by making a sale on and purchase agreement, it means there's no loan between the parties because because sale is the shifting ownership or right from someone to dominant and owning to the other. Then a sale and a purchase agreement that had been made by both parties became null and void. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. So thank you, Ranji, for your question. So uh, I'll move to the next speaker. Uh, who's next? Next speaker is Denny Setiawan. Uh, he will speak, uh, present us about the role of notary on the application of Indonesian business field standard of uh, classification in 2017 and use of licensing application through online single submission uh, to establishment associated or an amendment of the basic limited liability companies. I'll give the floor to Denny Setiawan. Thank you, Miss. Hello. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. You have five uh, minutes. Thank you to Miss Nukila Ivanti for giving me time, and thank you to all. Uh, and before I I present in my my presentation, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dennis Tiawan, uh, and I'm from uh, Prima Indonesia University University Indonesia. Okay, this is I I will share my. My subject is the role of notary on the application of Indonesian business field standard classification in 2017 and use the licensing application through online single submission or OCTS to establishment associate or amendment the basic limited liability company. Okay, introduction and uh, the notary authorities uh, authority to make authentic deed is clearly expressly regulated in provision of article 15 of law number two of uh, 2014 concerning the position of notary public The notary is uh, authorized to make authentic deeds regarding all action, agreement, and stipulation required by statutory regulation and all which the interested party wants to be started in the authentic deed. There are three main elements that are essential to fulfill the formal requirement that a deed is an authentic deed, namely the form determined by law. Number two, made by uh, or before a general official. Number three, made by or in a presence of said deed by or before the public official who has the authority to do so and at the place where the deed was drawn up in a general official. The notary is authorized to make the deed as long as the parties want, want it to according to the legal rules, it must be made in the form of an authentic deed. The making of the deed must be based on legal rules relating to the procedure for making a notary deed. Next, uh, for example, drawing up and deed, uh, deed uh, of establishment or amendment uh, a business entity such as a limited partnership, limited liability company, and other form or business entity. In connection with uh, the insurance of regulation of the head, the head of the Central Statistic Agency number 19 of 2017 concerning the classification of Indonesian business field standard and uh, regulation, government regulation number 424. 
of 2018 regarding electrologically integrated business licensing services as notary as a general officer who makes the deed of establishment and amendment the to the article of associations of business entities must comply with the provision of the legal rules set by the government and it the process of recording the acts in the menu of the legal entity administration system as well as the business entity administration system is according with the rules set by government uh, in the name uh, minister ministry of law and human rights and must be professional in carrying out their duties problem what is the authority and role of the notary as a general official is making authentic deed number two how is the application of the uh, 2070 indonesia standard business class uh, field classification or kbli to deed, to the deed of Establish an amendment to article association business entities and use the licensing application through online single submission. And number three, what is the responsibility of the notary in carrying out his duties and positioning position on the deed made by or before him? Jenny? Yes. Yes. Uh, someone said that your voice is not clear. Can you, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, okay, okay let's try. Okay, uh, I'm actually in the section program formulation theoretical in this thesis with uh, two, two theory. One, uh, legal certainty theory, this theory is used uh, to determine the role and authority of a notary as a public official in making authentic deeds in order to create legal certainty for deeds made before a notary, notaries must be professional in making deeds at the request of their clients and apply the rules and principle in making deeds so their deed do not conflict with application applicable legal rules. And number two, the theory of legal responsibility. This is needed uh, to be able to explain the legal consequences of the deed made and the responsibilities of the notary relating to his or her authority based on the law, on the position of notary public and other situation, statutory provision. Conclusion. The authority of the notary is crying out his or her duties as a public, public uh, official is an authority obtained by mean uh, distribution which is normal, normatively uh, regulated in the law on the position of notary public. And then uh, in exercising uh, this authority, notaries are given limitation or restriction uh, in carrying out their duties, uh, duties and position which are regulated by statutory regulation and the notary code ethics. The Indonesia, the Indonesian standard industrial classification is a grouping of economic activities into the Indonesian standard business classification from uniformity of concept. Definition of classification of business uh, field uh, is used uh, reference for parties in specific business activities as well as being the basis of for notary to making business uh, entity deal. Then the notary is responsible for the deed made by or in from open so that the notary in making the deed must comply with the applicable legal rules. For violating the law, the notary may be subject uh, to sanction. Uh, maybe number one, a civil sanction, namely in the form on of compensation of or interest. Number two administrative uh, sanction, namely in the form of written, writing, warning, temporary dismissal, honor, honor, uh, dismissal, or association on the Indonesian Ministry of the Law and Human Rights. 
And then number three, uh, criminal sanction, namely in the form of confinement or the body uh, for which allow switch reporting on claim of the field by the party who feel agrees the by the party acts to the respective competence against suggestion. It is recommended that the government in this case, Ministry of, uh, of Law and Human Rights of Indonesia, make a regulation, specially regulation legal protection for notaries in carrying out uh, their duties before uh, power and obligation according to applicable legal regulation. This is because there are some parties, both government agencies themselves and other parties who take action not in accordance with the rules again notaries as notary is carrying out their duties and position uh, have been regulated in the law and on notary position uh, UUGN and other laws and regulation and then it is, this is uh, it is uh, recommended that the notary to enactment of Indonesia standard business classification and the application for business licensing licensing through online single submission. And number three, this is recommended that the Indonesian Notary Association often conduct uh, socialization to notaries to carry out their duties uh, and position, position and provide maximum legal protecting uh, protection if the notary is subject to legal sanction on the deed made by or him. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Denis Setiawan, for a good presentation uh, regarding the notary deeds and the uh, notary authority. And uh, I uh, I've taken some notes regarding the notary deed. Uh, uh, the notary is responsible for what he or she did uh, uh, for uh, responsible for criminal uh, and can be applied criminal sanction and administri administrative sanction uh, and you you are suggesting uh, that Ministry of Law and Human Rights to uh, draft more or to uh, create more uh, law yes. to protect a uh, notary uh, for uh, their protection, right? For legal protection. And uh, thank you. I will give the floor to uh, anyone to ask question to Danny. Uh, Mr. Danny, yes, please. I have a question. Uh, what is the role of the notary for uh, the applic application of the business license application through online single submission or OSS related to the deed made by or before him? Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Can I ask for uh, Ms. Mugila? Yes, yes. Please, okay. Denny. In, in connection with the professional attitude of a notary who must who know about the development of knowledge related to his work and or it the request uh, of a business actor so that the notary helps him to submitting the application and process and input inputting uh, business businesses uh, licenses in the online single submission uh, or OSS application based on a power of authority. Uh, the notary must be professional as stipulated uh, in the rules of the notary code ethic. That's all. Thank you, Denny. Uh, I hope it's clear, yeah, for Cindy. Uh, the explanation from Denny. I'll move to the next, uh, next, uh, our presenter. Uh, let me read. Uh, the next presenter, uh, Pacar Pangimbur Permahadi, Kartina yes, Pakpahan, Tommy Leonard Mulyani. Iin Hot Para Pramulipurba, 
uh, and the title of the presentation effort to control fictitious order crime by grab online transportation drivers in Indonesia in Malaysia uh, study at uh, PT Solusi Transportasi Indonesia I'll give the time to Pacar and friends thank you miss hello yes please You have five minutes, Patar. Yes, Miss. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, best with all to all of us. May uh, may may we always be in God help. For this opportunity, I will present my risks and deal. That's how we cannot hear your voice. You are freeze now. So... Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, the problem in the research part is uh, three problem. Uh, what is the legal position between online transportation driver and uh, Grab Indonesia company? Two, what factor lead to fictive order crime rate at PT Grab, uh, Grab company done by the driver? Uh, three, how are the efforts to tackle the fictive order of Grab Indonesia company and Malaysia. Uh, this question uh, answer the problem number one. Uh, the position of the legal relationship between online transportation driver Driver online recognition based on the research result of PT Grab in the partnership agreement between between the Grab driver and Grab Indonesia company regulation the obligation the must be approved by Grab driver when installing the driver application including in the event that you violate the code of ethnic that you agree to and have section for termination of the partnership and not returning your wallet balance you have you have by release and release and will not sue grab for the remaining balance of your electronic wallet which is for forfeited as fine for the violation day you will be solely responsible for the liability and the violation caused by your action, the operation of your motorist passenger bill or taxi passenger delivery service, including but not limited to the individual injury, death and property damage. You are ready to be responsible for any loss suffered by Grab Indonesia if you are found to have violated and clause in the code of conduct. You are willing the value of your balance in the drive will uh, to be taken back by Grab Indonesia if you are proven to have committed misuse 
and criminal act or are blacklisted and terminated by your partnership due to the violating this code of conduct. In the case of sexual violence violation committed by you, you agree that uh, the event the event that uh, the report has been withdraw and or close grab has the right uh, it's absolute description the discretion to refund the investigation of the report and make the report and findings available to continue further investigation if the report is reported by the reported is carried out on the ground of intimidation and all the threat from the reported party even top beer uh, uh, has been a statement of this between and between the reported and the re reporter there are allegations of attempt to cause the reputation of threat to fall by reported and or reporter uh answer the question problem is number two uh factor causing of fictive order criminal action uh at uh, grab indonesia company based on the previous explanation about the legal relation relationship between the online grab and grab indonesia company is a partnership relationship that has a uh, equal position and does not regulate weak Difference, pay, and working power, unlike the work agreement between workers and employers, with regulated wage, difference, pay, and working power. Beside the there is unilateral police set by Grab Indonesia Company, which is uh, always determined to Grab driver, will certainly affect income, which can hamper the economic need of online grab driver so that grab driver often do fictive order to get bonus and more income to sustain the uh, economy needs of online grab driver uh, answer the problem number three fictive order criminal treatment in Indonesia and Malaysia, handling the criminal effective order in Indonesia, prevention of crime. Uh, in Indonesia, treatment in Indonesia, criminal order, uh, penal mediation according to Bardanawi, is view that uh, penal mediation has several terms, including mediation in criminal case or mediation in penal methods with the dots term is called straf bimeldeling and then in german it's called the outbreaks are till settle of gate then in france in scholar mediation penal for the more is it said the because penal medicine mainly brings together the preparator of the criminal offenses and the victim penal mediation is often now as victim of funder mediation. Currently, the national police and has started penal mediation since uh, the issue of the letter of the chief of police number four B three zero two two and X one one. 2009 CDA OPS December uh, 14 2009 regarding cash handling draft alternative dispute resolution here nectar responded to us ADR it means the letter of national police chief uh, valid for both parties both the perpetrator and the victim if they agree to meditate mediation on the condition the criminal offense committed a minor crime uh, 
mediation non penal non penal criminal justice system police uh, statement of crime case drop the court so the implementation of the non penal criminal justice system does not directly affect the presentation of the criminal arm basically non penal focus more the deterrent effect of the perpetrator of the criminal act so that criminal offender that's not repeated the legal in what uh, divided into four uh, namely uh, anglo saxon uh, common law european continental or civil law islamic law islamic legal system and customary law system the legal system in malaysia and indonesia is different this the because malaysia parties and the parties the anglo-saxon or common law legal system when indonesia parties the european continental legal system or civil law as the country the adhere to the anglo-saxon or common law legal system in malaysia there are four sort of law namely written law customary law islamic law and customary law written law consistent of federal and state constitutional federal parliamentary legislation and state legislation and additional legislation law and regulation addition additional legislation is made by, made by body or person authorized to perform this tax under federal parliamentary or state legislation where are the similarities and difference in regulation regarding and handling of criminal act indonesia and malaysia in indonesia any criminal acts can be proposed two way uh, mediasi penal and mediasi non penal will in malaysia criminal action can also be handled through court in uh, malaysia and as well as a native court of better now as the customary law system conclusi in my research uh, one based the result of the research and discussion above it can be considered a follow where the legal relationship between online transportation driver and online transportation company is based on the principle of the of an agreement which is subject to article uh, 1313 of the civil code the partnership agreement contract is based on three parties Uh, namely the driver, the provider, namely Grab Technology Indonesia Company, and application user. That is the partnership agreement between the driver and the Grab Company. The provision of the unilateral police set by uh, Grab Indonesia Company, and this police will certainly affect income so that driver who take is if often do victim or the victim to get bonus and more income to sustain the economic need on online grab driver where the similarities and similarities in regulation criminal action in indonesia and malaysia in indonesia the preventive of criminal act can be achieved in two ways uh, mediasi penal and non penal and trial process will in malaysia criminal action can be handled through court in malaysia as well uh, indigenous court or better now and customary law system thank you miss hello Thank you, Patar, for this uh, great presentation. I think uh, because uh, uh, you are explaining uh, and your friends uh, on the research regarding the legal relations between online driver and Grab company, uh, I found that this is uh, I, uh, 
a kind of partnership relation and i i found that there is uh, there doesn't uh, regulate wage or salary and working hours as well and just wondering uh, if this is under the undang-undang ketenaga kerjaan or labor law number 13 is it possible as well uh, this um, I, uh, i'm not really uh, 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 you know, uh, understand about how the relation uh, between the partnership relation with uh, under the law uh, of Ketenaga Kerja no uh, Labor Law. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, I would like to give the floor. Uh, if there is any question, raise hand, please. Hello. No questions in chat? Uh, hello. Room. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Please. Uh, okay, Mr. Watar. Uh, explain what is the basic. Yeah. What is the basic comparison of handling criminal acts in Ina and Malai? Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Denny. Uh, I can explain that uh, comparison of handling criminal acts in Indonesia and Malaysia. Please, uh, in the effort to resolve, such as in Indonesia, the preventive of criminal act can be carried out in two ways, two ways, uh, mediasi penal and mediasi non-penal. Uh, will in Malaysia, it can be carried uh, out the draft Malaysia court and Malayu court uh, action. Okay, Denny. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Pacar, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'm going to the next uh, presenter because we will have three more presenter because uh, before the end of the session, parallel session. I'll give the floor now to to uh, let me read uh, Felix Vijaya. Uh, he will uh, present uh, about the balance of contract in online insurance agreements in the era of Revolution 4.0, insurance products of several yeah. banks in Indonesia. Okay, Felix, okay. time is yours, five minutes. Felix, do you have any difficulties to share your screen? Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah, okay. 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 Um, before I want to say thanks to Miss Nukila FMT. Hello everyone. My name is Felix Vijaya from University of Indonesia Medan. Today, I would like to present about the balance of contracts in online insurance agreements in the era of Revolution 4.0, insurance products of several banks in Indonesia. Introduction. The speed of technological development becomes a challenge for its utilization as a tool that can profit fast, practice, and accurate information. To make it happen, it is necessary to support software and human resource that master the, the use of technology. Industrial Revolution 4.0 gives us a new perspective on social security service. This new trend encourages us to see what the future looks like if we, we are able to capitalize on this era. The rapid change from the digital revolution of, to the industrial revolution 4.0 emphasis 
the the use of computerization automation and electronic device this era limits the utilization of digital device with more complexity everything use internet simulation and autonomous robots digital technologies over convince for the community in carrying our activities in life and also of security opportunities for business for development section in insurance companies are one example of business taking advantage of opportunities for for the advancement of digital technology with the design of online based application in in the field of insurance and its development insurance companies in indonesia can process data board on the submission of the debt claims and acquire the payment more easily with the case paper usage to maintain the sustainability of the earth online insurance one of the innovation form as a result of the technology development where the company utilizes online media to conduct the entire process of targeting or selling its products the use of online media as distribution channel of insurance product is referred as electronic commerce or e-commerce electronic media becomes a tool in trading goods and service in a narrow sense e-commerce is intended for the scope of electronic trade in the form of trade via the internet or internet commerce internet web services or web commerce and electronic data exchange with a structured system electronic data interchange um, in this table you can see the difference similarities and effects of three three example bank in indonesia um, bank s bank y and bank z um, the differences submitting claims process with an online system not entire online or can be done with both online on offline system claim disbursement within 14 to 30 working days the similarities process process via online receive police in electronic form if their own websites and applications premium payments made through auto debit account credit card crypto account and bank transfer the advantage uh, can be pushed it's easily easy claim process over easy access via application or websites easier premium payments Okay, now we can see the summary of online insurance agreement procedures in general. From the insurance candidate to enter the website, after that, choose products, clicks by now, fills in medical history form, premium calculation, fills in application form, fills in the insurance beneficiary, summary and payment. After that, we got the e-police. If the consumer has agreed to the clip wrap agreement and brush wrap agreement system, the offer and acceptance have result in an online agreement. A deal is one of the valid terms of the agreement in accordance with Article 1520 of the Civil Code. In other words, the deal has result in a valid agreement. Prospective police police holders have an important principle called take it or leave it principle where they are free to make all decision to oppose or reject also you can take or leave it the characteristics of standards agreements in insurance result in police holders having weak and unblessed legal protection okay now countries conclusion according to the auto uh, on online insurance products there is a balance with the fulfillment of the rights and obligations of its party and also through the letter of application for insurance that has been agreed by the parties during the application for insurance customers are also free to choose the type of the product benefits receive the amount of premium the period of coverage in accordance with the will and needs of the customer after that the insurance company must fulfill its obligations in accordance with the applicable police. But parties also benefit from each other, namely customer get a feeling of protection from all possible risks and insurance companies get a profit called premium. Simply put,
Can you put insurance products which constraints from information source, product selection, planning, assessment of risks, under, underwriting, negotiation, contract signature, payments to claim made by using electronic or digital device for certain products. There are some process that must be done conventionally, but overall, online insurance is more focused on, on, on electronic mechanism using software or application. If the online insurance agreement is default, the things that can be taken are, are default between the insurer and the insurance can be done by deliberation and consensus. However, if the dispute cannot be resolved by deliberation and consensus, the insurer and the insurer can choose a settlement through the court or through the Indonesian insurance mediation and arbitration agency or to the other alternative dispute resolution institution established by the financial service authority. Okay, now suggestion. Suggestion. The government and the financial service authority should establish a clear regulation in online insurance implementation rules as a legal protector for the insurer and the insurer. Online insurance companies as, as insurers opt to provide more detailed information. So the insurer can understand the insurance product is better and the pers prospective insurer is expected to provide the correct information without committing fraud. Understand and implement the agreement in all concerns. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for the presentations, mm -hmm. uh, for your great presentations uh, uh, regarding um, uh, the online uh, insurance uh, products. Uh, I have taken note that uh, that there is yeah, uh, already a balance of fulfillment of rights and obligation through a letter of application uh, agreed by parties, uh, by 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 parties. Uh, however, uh, as you mentioned, that there is a need more cl clearer uh, regulation uh, from the government and the financial uh, service uh, to have a more uh, um, uh, uh, enforced regulation and more clearer uh, regulations. Uh, is my understanding. Okay, uh, thank you, Felix. I would like to give the floor uh, if there is any questions, comments for Felix for this interesting subject about online uh, insurance. Raise hand, please. If there is a, any question in chat, or it's already clear for all of you. So I'll give the uh, thank you, Felix. Okay, uh, I'll give the next uh, uh, presentation for. Let me read it uh, for this hours. Uh, for uh, Said Riza, uh, uh, with the title "Juridical Review of the Judge Decision in the Credit Agreement Decision Case Study." of decision case number 40, 2019. I'll give the floor to Said Rizal. The time is yours. You have only five minutes. We have uh, the last one uh, speaker, Alfindo. Said Rizal. Where is Said Rizal? Said Rizal? Or Veronica? Yeah? I forget. If there is no Said Rizal, I'll give to the uh, next present the pre uh, the next presenter. Uh, sorry. Okay, I have uh, uh, Veronica. Yeah, I have Veronica who will replace uh, Said Rizal. Yeah. Veronica, please, Veronica. Uh, 
Okay, Miss Veronica, I can help you. Can you share the PPT? Maybe Sakius, can you help Aranika to share her PPT? Um, yes, Miss, but Veronica not uh, reply my message. Do you need some help, Karanika? So the committee will share your PPT. Uh, good morning everyone. Let me introduce myself. My name is Veronica and partnering with Gabriel, Adela, uh, Joshua and Cecilia. We are from uh, University of Prima Indonesia. Today, I will present about juridical review of the just decision in the credit agreement decision. Case number 40 slice PDTG slice 20, 2019 uh, Do you have PowerPoint presentation, Veronica? Yes. Because you only have five minutes. Uh, this. Okay, so would you please help uh, Veronica? Thank you, Sakeus. Okay, miss. Please wait. I will share. Thank you. Can you read it? Yes, yes. Yes, 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 I think uh, Veronica PPT have a uh, trouble. Uh, he share her PPT, but uh, my Windows can read this. So I can share 
her PPT. I Can think I it's share better it? you share later, but the presenter uh, present uh, his paper. Please try to 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 share later, but I think the presenter go on to to talking about uh, your presentation. Okay. I will start my presentation. Uh, Okay, research background. One, optimization of low number of 10 of 1998 of banking. Two, researching and analyzing default in banking. Three, examine and analyze the verdict on the case number. Four, educating the public, especially business actor or credit procedure in the event of default. Formulation of the problem. One, what is the juridical analysis of the just consider consideration in the verdict of the case for 40 slice PDTG slice 2019 slice PN the MDN. Two, what was the reason for the panel of judge rejection? The default suit in the case verdict for 14, uh, 40 slice PDTG slice 2019 slice PN the MDN. Writing purpose. One, this is to find out how to regulate default in the credit agreement in the law and regulation in Indonesia. Two, to find out the juridical reason for the just decision in trying case number 14, sorry, 40 slash PDTG slash 2019 slash PN the MDN. Three, to find out what underlies in the rejection made by the panel of judge against in default suit number 40 slash PDTG slash 2019 slash PN.MDN. The benefit of writing. One, theoretical benefit. benefit. They can be used as material for study legal development related to default. Two, practical benefit. Giving juridical contribution about default. Veronica, you have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, introduction. In the banking law of that profit credit, there must be a credit agreement. Agreement is an action with which one or more parties bind themselves to one or more people. Credit agreement are provision that have legal certainty and apply as law for the parties related to the agreement. From the agreement, there is a legal relationship between the two parties that made it, which is called the engagement. In, in, in implementing the bank credit agreement, it is possible that one of the parties will default or re neglect the obligations that and mutually agree upon in the credit agreement. In default, there are three forms or criteria, namely, the authorized party does, doesn't perform at all. The authorized party is late in carrying out its obligation. Uh, two discussion 2.1 default in the credit agreement according to the legislation in Indonesia the agreement in a credit agreement must be made in writing this based this based on the provision content in the elucidation of article 8 of law number 7 of 1992 concerning banking which obliges ob obliges bank as lender to make written agreement. The banking agreement obligation that require a written agreement have been stipulated in the main banking regulation by Bank Indonesia as river or to in Article 8, Paragraph 2 in the banking law. According to Sudikno Mertokusumo, civil procedural law is a legal regulation that determines how to guarantee the implementation of material civil law. In general, in general, the civic procedural law is the settlement of civic case settlement of judge in the lawsuit preparation court. Filling a lawsuit is meaning a lawsuit court decision 
up to the execution or implementation of court decision. I go to the conclusion. Conclusion. One, the obscurity of the plaintiff lawsuit or obscure label was due to not clearly stating whether the defend action were illegal or in default because the plaintiff only state that defend I defend understand the good fact of plaintiff to pay off the credit. So in in the defense exception, the defense state that the plaintiff made a mistake in taking legal action for the lawsuit because the plaintiff should be legally filled in the form of resistance to the plaintiff. Three, Based on the consideration of the panel of judge against the lawsuit filed by the plaintiff with the legal fact rival at the trial, the panel of judge will try this case said the state that the lawsuit should be in the form of resistance to plaintiff. Asset option sell process due to bad credit carried out by defense. With uh, assistance of defense, if the auction process has been carried out and completed, then the machine for legal action will be open to the to the attempt to file a lawsuit. The plaintiff suggestion one in law, the lack of clarity in a lawsuit is something that often ha ha happens because so far the plaintiff has just paid interest in the credit. However, the plaintiff option can making a lawsuit must also be more careful to avoid the cancellation of law of lawsuit. So, according to the authors, the plaintiff must understand that the lawsuit should be in the form of resistance to the plaintiff asset sale process due to bad credit credit carried to to find out by defense with the assistance of defense. If the auction process has been carried out and the auction process has been completed, then the machine of legal action will be open through effort to file a lawsuit by the plaintiff. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, uh, for your good presentation uh, regarding the 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 ju the juridical review of the judge's decision in the credit agreement. Uh, I take a point, uh, some notes regarding uh, there is lack of clarity yeah, uh, regarding the lawsuits uh, based on this uh, juridical review. Uh, uh, for the plaintiffs uh, also. Uh, I would like to give uh, the floor uh, if there is any questions to Veronica or comments, please. By raise hands or uh, uh, on the chat room. No, I think it's Clear, yeah. Now uh, we are going to the last. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, we are going to the last presenter. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, the last presenter is um, Alvindo Sebastian Putra Barus. Uh, he will speak about juridical analysis of claim rejection of uh, SmartLink insurance program, flexi account uh, plus and critical illness plus at PT Alliance Indonesia Insurance um, in Medan branch. Uh, the time is yours, uh, Alvindo. Five minutes. You can help show me. PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Wait, we start.
you may start Alvindo while uh, the committee is uh, trying to share your PPT. You may you bisa dimulai Alvindo sambil yes. um, ya yeah. thank you. Oke. Okay. Thank you for the chance uh, audience and this uh, Nukila. Uh, my name is uh, Alvin Dos Bastian Putra Barus. I'm from uh, Prima Indonesia University. I show presentation, my presentation. Uh, my title My title article is Juridical Analysis of Claim Rejection of Smart Link Insurance Program Plat C on Plus and Critical Illness plus at PT Alliance Indonesia Insurance Medan Bias. Start the legal relationship between the parties in the insurance agreement is the customer as the as the insurance and the insurance company as the insurer the right and obligation are set for for in the form of a police policy and explain the premium in insurance practice not all claims should made by the by the insurer are accept will the criteria for rejection of customer claims by The alliance company include completeness, complete completeness of claim document, except the predetermined time claim are not covered by the agreement. Production. Human living life affirming activity are faced with the possibility. Of uncertainty in the form of even that cause of sense of insecurity, cal risk, derived from economic factor, natural factor, or human factor. This risk process a burden of love to property or the human soul itself. Human life planning is inspirable for insurance of coverage, which is a trans translation. Of English insurance or assurance, arising from human Apologize, insurance. Alvindo. Apologize, Alvindo. Maybe you can, uh, because we have only five minutes. Maybe just some uh, of my suggestion to start with the problem statements and okay, then. Thank uh, yeah, thank you so much. Program formulation. How is the smart link insurance program agreement flexicon plus and critical illness plus at PT Alliance Indonesia Medan Branch insurance with, with customers? How is the rejection of claim and settlement of the rejection of claim of smart link insurance program flexicon plus and critical illness plus at PT Alliance Indonesia Insurance Medan Branch? In research, appropriate methods and required and appropriate to the type of research conduct, conducted as well as systematic and consistent. The method in this study is empiric, empirical juri, juridical. The empirical juridical approach is a problematic approach regarding matters of a, of a juridical nature and the fact of the implementation of life insurance claim in PT Alliance Medan Branch, empirical research of social, social logical research in legal research that uses primary data. According to the empirical approach is based on, on fake obtained from research and observ observation. Research is conducted based on scientific methods and the that 
are part of the empirical approach. The research is also based on leg legal theory, the provis provisions of applicable laws on reg regulation, as well as the opinion of scholar and expert. Claim rejection and settlement claim rejection of smuggling insurance program flexi complex and critical illness plus epitalence Indonesia insurance maiden bridge. A claim is a fragment of a promise made by the insurer at the time of entering entering into a con contract. A claim contract contain a demand for acknowledgement of a fact the one is no and delete to own or have something, the bidding of claim is sir one types of claims, A majority claim, B early claims, C did claim, two survival benefit, people benefit can can be paid before the due date, due date but only for up to a certain period, example period payment under withdrawals and bond bonus of loyalty addiction. Alfindo, you have three minutes. Okay. More. Conclusion, the legal relationship of the parties in the insurance agreement is the consumer as insured and the insurance company as insured, the right and obligation in the agreement are set out in the form of policy and explain the premiums. In the practice of insurance, not all claims sub submit by the insured are accepted. This criteria for the rejection of customer claims by the alliance company include complementness of claim documents, exceeding the predetermined minute time. Claims are not covered in the agreement. Before the Polish book, the disease was already there. Except exception in filling claims and breaking the law. Settlement of insurance claim dispute can be done by the Financial Service Authority. The insurance policy contains a cost on how to resolve disputes such as deliberation, arbitration, or, or court. In, in addition, this force can be resolved through this would result in a wage agencies such as the customer dispute resolution agency and the Indonesia Insurance Mediation Agency. Thank you for attention all. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Miss. Okay. okay, thank you, Alfindo, for the good presentation. Uh, as I can uh, take a bit uh, notes uh, from your presentation uh, in practice that the insu uh, the insurance uh, alliance company uh, uh, sometimes they are not accept uh, the claim yeah from the insured. Uh, for some reasons, uh, so if uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to participants, if you have any comments and questions uh, to Alvindo, I have Are, a question. Yeah, please. Thanks, thanks to the moderators who have allowed me to ask my question. Are in Indonesian speech? Seperti yang kita ketahui, asuransi memberikan kita transfer resiko. Jadi, jika dalam kasus ini pihak alians tidak akan klaim dirugi kepada 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 nasabah, itu bagaimana langkah yang kita dapat lakukan apabila case ini terjadi kembali? Apakah kita lakukan upaya hukum atau bagaimana gitu Bu. Terima kasih. Kasih Yosua. Tidak mengganti 
uh, klaim tersebut begitu iya dari perusahaan iya pak uh, sebab sebab yang menyebabkan klaim itu tidak dibayarkan oleh uh, ya perusahaan itu ada beberapa sebab itu oleh karena ada sebelumnya hmm, sebelumnya risiko yang dia dia alami sebelum masuk asuransi uh, dan banyak lagi hal-hal yang memang membuat klaim itu tidak dibayarkan oleh perusahaan salah satunya dia uh, memiliki penyakit sebelum dia masuk asuransi itu bakal batal dan yang kedua itu dia terlambat bayar premi terlambat bayar premi dan uh, mungkin seperti itu cuman dalam kasus ini masalahnya seperti apa bang? apakah dia tidak membayarkan preminya atau dia memang sudah ada penyakit sebelum merawat penyakit dan itu bisa uh, klaimnya bisa dibatalkan oleh pihak perusahaan gitu dalam asuransi kesehatan sendiri apa kan penyakit itu include dia misalkan kok ada tiba-tiba terjadi penyakit kan mereka kan me, maaf ya mereka mengganti resiko akibat penyakit itu biasa perawatan jadi kalau kalau tidak ada tidak ada penggantian hak tersebut itu bagaimana itu pak perusahaan tidak akan pernah uh, tidak akan tidak akan uh, membatalkan klaimnya jika laut uh, nasabah tidak ada masalah seperti yang saya bilang tadi mungkin uh, nasabahnya telat bayar atau mungkin dia sudah ada riwayat penyakit cuman dia tidak uh, tidak cek ke dokter itu sebelumnya begitu jadi sebelum masuk ke asuransi tersebut mungkin di situ adalah peranan agent yang sangat penting begitu agentnya apakah benar-benar mengatakan apa yang risiko yang ditimbulkan jika lo dia batal batal klaimnya gimana gitu mungkin dia tidak memberitahukan sebelumnya nah itu dia yang membuat uh, klaim itu ditolak oleh perusahaan mungkin itu saja oke okay, thank you Alvindo for your uh, explanation Joshua do you understand about <laughs> the what had been explained by uh, Alvindo ya yeah, hmm. I have one more uh, I see I There is one more question ya Pak Emanuel. Pak Al Pak Alpindo. Emanuel, last question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can speak bahasa Ibu? Ya, ya boleh, boleh. Silakan uh, Pak. Uh, terima kasih Ibu. Saya mau bertanya uh, buat Bapak Alpindo. Iya. Yeah. Uh, bagaimana uh, caranya? Contohnya nih dalam uh, setiap agent kan cara penyampaian ke kantor pusatnya agar nasabahnya bisa di diterima. Hmm. Nah, pasti kan ada beberapa data yang tidak sesuai dengan di lapangan. Nah, pas pengekleman resikonya ke nasabah tersebut. Nah, jadi bagaimana? Uh, um, so sorry, sorry, uh, Emmanuel, because this more technical. I would like to have uh, um, uh, do of the time as well because uh, this more technical. Maybe you can. As uh, Alvindo after the session, the parallel session, it's uh, uh, just uh, I, because I I have to uh, tight on schedule, yeah. So apologize for uh, interrupting your your question. So uh, uh, for all the presenters and uh, all the participants. Uh, thank you, Alvindo, for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, uh, this uh, already uh, almost the end of the time. So we got a lot of a lot, a lot of things uh, from today's preview presentation, and I congratulate all the speakers for uh, providing useful uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, I would like to end this session and would like to. Uh, 
apologize if I have mentioned uh, something not really uh, in line with your uh, acceptance. And I would like to say thank you and uh, have a good uh, day. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Ada absensinya enggak, Bu? Ada itu di chat. Sudah saya chat, Ci. Sudah saya chat. Sudah saya chat. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.
menyadari sepenuhnya bahwa dunia sudah berubah, Indonesia pun sudah berubah, dan oleh karenanya UKI pun harus berubah. Untuk itu kita mempersiapkan diri untuk menjadi universitas berskala internasional. Transformasi sudah dilakukan, perbaikan-perbaikan pun juga sudah dilakukan. Sekarang UKI dengan dukungan teknologi tinggi menjadi satu universitas yang unggul, khususnya di bidang tridharma perguruan tinggi, yaitu pembelajaran, penelitian, dan pengabdian masyarakat. Saya berkeyakinan dan mengimani bahwa UKI menjadi UKI yang hebat. UKI hebat!
ini ini pak
ठीक Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the first international conference on law and, law and human rights, ICLHR 2021, with the theme ASEAN Diversities and its Principles Toward ASEAN Legal Integration in Pandemic Era. Let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I almost slipped out of my tongue because uh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with the sound. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like everyone must have had a great time presenting as well as being participant and even being the moderator. And today, like we, we have promised before, that we will continue with the next two sessions that I believe will be so much uh, beneficial for our knowledge and for the implementation of the result of this conference today. As we promised, today we will have a keynote speech session and then after that we will have a panel session as well. So again, uh, it is such a privilege for us to be here on this first international conference on law and human rights. I mean, the first international conference on law and human rights ICLHR 2021 with the theme ASEAN Diversity and its principles toward ASEAN legal integration in pandemic era. This international conference organized by the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, in collaboration with Hans Seidel Foundation and Ministry of Law and Human Rights of the Republic of Indonesia and co-organized by Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan and Universitas Jayabaya. Again, we give a big round of applause for yeah, for the committee and also for those who have contributed to the running of this program today. And ladies and gentlemen, it is such a great honor to have among us today Cecilia Jimenez Damari, a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons as keynote speaker. And to lead us in the keynote speech session, Allow me to welcome our excellent moderator today. Dr. Arya Priyansa is a lecturer at the University of Indonesia. He is teaching about international law at the Faculty of Law, and he completed his Doctor of Philosophy from the Faculty of Law, University of Otago, New Zealand. He is also the head of the Indonesian Society of International Law Lecturers, or ISILL, from 2020 to 2024 as well as executive board members of the ASEAN, I mean ASEAN Society of International Law or ASEAN SIL from 2019 to 2021. Last but not least, I think this is also very important. Today is his birthday. So while wishing him a very happy birthday, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with a big round of applause, Dr. Ari Afriansa. <laughs>
All right. Thank Everybody you very Ari, much. Ari Afriansa. Hopefully we don't put you on spot, but <laughs> again, happy birthday. You may take Thank your you time. Thank you so now. much. Thank you so much, uh, the committee, and especially uh, for the Universitas uh, Christian Indonesia. It is very uh, an honor for me. Uh, I don't know where to start because I'm so flattered because I I, I, I never expect uh, this kind of a surprise. Again, thank you so much for your kind uh, appreciation of my birthday. Thank you so much. Um, well, again, this is not my... Uh, this is not my time here because I don't know whether this is a coincidence or not, but yes, this is my birthday. Thank you so much. And it's turned out 40 now. So as Sam says, as the life begins at 40. So I'm very privileged for today. So um, again, thank you so much for uh, the introduction, the kind introduction. And I'm here uh, very privileged uh, to be invited as the uh, moderator of this uh, very uh, important uh, conference uh, that we have uh, not many, yeah, not many international conference conducted during the uh, uh, pandemic era. So I really appreciated uh, the committee uh, during the session. Without further ado, I would like to uh, um, read the short CV of uh, Miss Cecilia Jimenez Damari. Uh, she is the special rapporteur. Uh, on the human rights of uh, international, internally displaced persons. Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Damari, uh, she's from the Philippines, was appointed uh, as a special rapporteur on human rights of internally displaced persons by the Human Rights Council in September 2016 and assumed the mandate on the 1st November 2016. Ms. Jimenez Damari is a lawyer in human rights and international humanitarian law specialized in forced displaced and immigrate in migration. She has over three decades experience in NGO human rights advocacy for the Asia Pacific region and teaching experience as an adjunct professor of international human rights and humanitarian law. Ms. Jimenez Damari previously acted as senior legal advisor and trainer with the Internal Displaced Monitoring Center or IDMC of the Norwegian Refugee Council in Geneva. As the national director of the IDP project of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines, and as the government representatives to the Philippine Transnational Justice and Reconciliation Commission for the Bangsamoro. Ms. Jimenez holds an LLM in public international law from King's College London, the UK, and MDC in international organizations, MBA from the University of Geneva, Switzerland, an LLB from Ateneo de Manila, the Philippines, and a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from the University of the Philippines. She was admitted to the Integrated Bar of the Philippines in the 1990. Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Damari, uh, the place is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari, for the kind invitation. And I would like to wish you a happy birthday as well. Thank you so much. I think it's always uh, very good to start uh, the day, start the decade with such auspicious moments. So congratulations. I would like to thank the international, um, the university, the Christian university for this kind invitation. Um, and it's really my pleasure and honor to be with you. I'm just in the neighboring country, like right now, locked down like everybody else in their home countries. So with that, it is so much easier now to be in contact with many people, many academics, many NGOs, UN agency, but very important for the work that I'm doing, internally displaced persons from all over the world. So in a way that is a bit of um, a good thing, that the digital transformation, so to speak, has made us to be more connected. As uh, the introduction has said, um, I hold the office of the United Nations Special Rapporteur of the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. For those who may not know much about it, it is an independent expert position of the United Nations appointed by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. 
under the General Assembly. Therefore, as a special rapporteur, I report both to the Human Rights Council as well as to the General Assembly. This is very important work in my in, in reporting tasks because this is where I am in a very good position to bring up certain issues concerning the protection of the human rights of internally displaced persons that would otherwise be ignored, minimized, or set aside. And of course, my tasks as set by the resolutions of the United Nations are very much embedded in international law, which is my specialization. Um, I was actually, it was actually suggested that I um, uh, share the PowerPoint that I earlier provided because it is quite a new topic. Because I would like to talk about using international law for the international protection of internally displaced persons. So let me just put that on the screen. And please tell me if. It's fine. Yes, we can see right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So protection of internally displaced persons and uh, is a topic and, and I would like to present to you the international legal framework, which is actually based on existing international law as codified in the guiding principles on internal displacement. But perhaps from the beginning, we can already ask what does this have to do with the ASEAN? Well, you and I know that as ASEAN countries, as members of the international community and practically, and of course, members of the United Nations govern themselves also in accordance with international law. But I don't have to tell you much about that, but this is where the legal framework is very important. Um, I'm trying to, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to move it. You can click maybe on the arrow on the right bottom. Or anywhere you can click, usually it will move by itself. Okay, thank you. Ah, there is it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I clicked too much. Um, sorry, I'm not very technologically good. Um, shall I start again to put it? Because uh, I missed one PowerPoint. Maybe okay. you can click back if you wish. You see the arrow on the... Okay. okay. Voila. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ari. So the very first question that comes to mind um, in this international conference vis-a-vis -vis this is why do we need an international legal framework? And as I said, I know that you have been speaking about this, but let me zoom in very specifically on the protection of internally displaced persons before we talk about who IDPs are. Protection human rights of internally displaced persons is obviously governed by international law and its principles. And many of our constitutions actually um, admit that all of us as sovereign nations are governed by international law. I know that there are very different countries within the ASEAN, but in the Philippines, I can tell you that our constitution is a monist constitution, whereby the principles of international law are um, are admitted to be part of the law of the land. So this is why we are monist. And I think most of the countries in the ASEAN are monist by principle. We also know that there are other kinds of countries which are dual, um, whereby they do need some legislation uh, in order to put into effect international law and its principles. So. I'm putting that on the table immediately because I think it's important to already understand we, where we are each coming from, either from a monist jurisdiction or a dual uh, jurisdiction. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to this because I'm assuming that everybody here is, uh, or at least a lot of people here would know about international law. But nevertheless, 
The protection of internally displaced persons anywhere in the world is a public international concern. In fact, it could also be a peace concern because particularly where the presence of IDPs is a consequence of civil strife or war, then that threatens the peace and security, not only of the country concerned, but the region as well and, and the world. And this is where the Security Council may come in. It is important, of course, to emphasize that there is, um, this is all based on the international principle of sovereignty as responsibility as part and parcel of public international law. Nevertheless, that sovereignty is regarded as responsibility. Sovereignty in this sense, and the R2P, the responsibility to protect principle of the United Nations have very much put to the fore that it is not enough to just have sovereignty to do anything you want in the country as far as the state is concerned, but it is also a responsibility to protect your people, to guarantee the welfare, the human dignity and human rights of, that, of the people within that legal jurisdiction. We all know as well that the international legal framework is informed as per country by country by the ratification of human rights treaties and their application. Many states in the ASEAN have actually ratified um, some of the treaties. Again, the Philippines have ratified many of the treaties, including, I mean, especially the human rights treaties. And at, at, at the very least for the ASEAN countries, what is very, um, uh, common to everybody, to all of the ASEAN countries, is the ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And of course, there will be differing, um, uh, differing performances of each state vis-a-vis -vis the ratification of other human rights treaties and their application. So all of these are implications for the ASEAN countries as countries, as independent countries. But it is also important to raise at this point in time that the international legal framework is likewise um, uh, significant when we are talking about human rights in the ASEAN as a collective. And here we will need to do a little bit more research and work vis-a-vis -vis the embodiment of the international legal framework of protection of IDPs and how the ASEAN Charter and of course the Asia, Asia can, can provide really the application vis-a-vis -vis IDP protection. So let's go to who is an IDP. Um, many people have asked me very much about uh, IDPs, and, and most of the time when I ask, who is an IDP? What's an IDP? And people would always tell me, oh, a displaced person? Yes, obviously. A refugee? No. An asylum seeker? No. A migrant? International migrant? No. But this is the definition of an internally displaced persons, and we all have IDPs in all our countries. And most of the countries in the world also have IDPs. Even Italy had an, had an IDP situation a few months ago when the storm came in and there was a lot of flooding. So let's go to what the definition is. And so you will see how common it is to have internally displaced persons in one's country. First, there are persons, a group of persons who have been forced or obliged to flee. Now, as a lawyer, let me get into uh, the discussion of force or oblige. When we say force or oblige, force is really the physical force. There are guns all over the place. There's bombing. I've been to war zones and you can see, of course, why IDPs, people have to flee and become IDPs, but also oblige. Oblige is not exactly you have to go right now. But oblige is when the person or persons feel that unless they leave, 
their homes or places of habitual residence, they will risk their lives or their securities. Um, I went to Libya two years ago, and let me just show you the difference between the force or oblige. And in Libya, it was very clear to me that there are some people who have been forced. Like this is, a, there was a particular tribe in Libya whom I really spoke to, who were forced at gunpoint to leave their, their homes um, because of political affiliations. But there are also people in Libya. I also met people who came from the east of Libya, which is under the de facto authority uh, of um, uh, a non-state armed group leader. And there was lots of killings and human rights violations. So I was, I heard testimonies from people who were members of families who were being targeted. Now, they were not forced at gunpoint or there were no uh, bombs around them that forced them, but they were obliged to flee because otherwise they could be next on the line when it comes to being shot or being detained or being executed. So force and oblige mainly provides us a non-voluntary basis for the flight. So which is very different from an economic migrant because an economic migrant would say, okay, I want to earn more money. I want to, to see how I can uh, have a better life for myself and for my family. Nobody's forcing me or obliging me to leave where I live, but I have to go because I want a better life. I don't have jobs here, et cetera. So that would be an economic migrant. An economic migrant is not an IDP because of the voluntary nature of the leaving. Now, where did they leave? They, 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 they flee or leave their homes or places of habitual residence. So please be very um, careful that actually homes and places of habitual residence may not be the same. This is why it's an or. For those who are law students, you would catch on to this very quickly because, okay, it may be your home, or and I'm sorry, it may be your place of habitual residence, but it's not your home. And this is also why citizenship is not a basis for saying who is an IDP or not. I actually had some um, uh, cases that were sent to me in a country where the refugees coming from outside that country, obviously, the refugees of that country who were non-citizens of the country were forced by a mob to leave their homes. So I took the case because regardless of their citizenship, because they were at the time living in their place of habitual residence, which is the host country. Okay, so, but why do they leave? It's a result of, or in order to avoid armed conflict situations, situations of generalized violence, violations of human rights, and natural or human-made disasters. I'm giving a lot of time to this slide because this is where the, um, uh, a, a lot of confusion lies and this is the basis for IDP protection. Armed conflict, I think is very, very clear. Situations of generalized violence can be any generalized violence. It can be mobs. I would like to inform you actually that a few years ago, I sent to the Indonesian government uh, uh, communications about the violence in Aceh, whereby a mob um, pushed out a group of, um, I think they were transgender or LBT, L, L, LGBT people out of Aceh and they had to go to another part of Indonesia. Now, the generalized violence, the mob is considered also a cause of that displacement. I um, also was able to see firsthand another, uh, in another country, uh, El Salvador, which I visited officially in 2017. And there they had no armed conflict. But what do they have? They have maras and maras, are the criminal gangs uh, because basically what they do is they take over barrio, you know, uh, barangay 
uh, we call it the Philippines, uh, locality by locality, and make it their own. And, uh, and there was another country that I went to. We took a helicopter, one hour from the capital, and we went to these mountains where a lot of indigenous peoples were being, um, were, were fleeing because the drug gangs were taking over their land so that they can plant more of the cannabis for- I'm sorry, Ms. Cecilia. Uh, yes. We have uh, so limited time. Uh, yeah. So it's about uh, five more minutes. Thank you so much. That's fine. Thank you. No, I'm not going to do all the slides because I think uh, this is the most important thing. Um, and so even criminal gangs, uh, drug gangs are, are import, are, are, can be the cause of displacement. Then of course you have violations of human rights. And for example, housing evictions, which happen to a lot of countries. There are natural made, there are natural disasters. We all have experienced that. Um, and this could be in terms of typhoons, floodings, et cetera. And of course, human made disasters. Um, and human-made disasters can be in the case of mining corporations, for example, development projects. And these development projects, um, particularly when it comes to people who have ancestral claim to their lands, therefore they actually have, you know, they're being kicked out of their lands for economic interest of these projects. And last but not the least, they have not crossed an internationally recognized border. Because if they cross an internationally recognized border, then therefore they would be an international migrant or a refugee or an asylum seeker. So I hope that's very clear and you can already look into your own different countries as to whether or not you have IDPs. And I know you do. Okay, I'm trying to change again. So who is responsible for IDPs? First of all, it's the responsibility of the state. Therefore, the state is supposed to apply the international law of protection for IDPs, be it the local government, the regional government, or the national government. And international assistance, the things that we have been seeing where the UN comes in, is merely supplementary. It is not the primary responsibility of, um, of, uh, of the UN. Supplementary and complementary, and of course they do this a lot for rapid assistance for emergencies. I was the head of the project of the IDP protection in the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. At that time that we had the Haiyan, which was the biggest uh, typhoon ever uh, for many years. And in, in, within two hours, it displaced one million people. The United Nations came in for emergencies. For, and, and that's fine because it was an emergency and the Philippine government asked for that. However, it is important not to detract from the fact that the primary responsibility, responsible holder of international law, because it's a state, you know this, is actually the state itself and the government is supposed to implement that. So I would like to share with you in the last three minutes certain uh, aspects that you may want to look at that how do you implement international law in the country's concern when it comes to IDP protection? Well, first of all, the national laws and policies. And um, some of the countries, not so much in the ASEAN, unfortunately, are actually, uh, actually have adopted very specific laws for the protection of IDPs. Uh, Nigeria, for ex uh, Nigeria, for example, Ukraine, uh, El Salvador, as I mentioned. Important as well is data and analysis. And for data and analysis, you have to have the development agencies of the country ensuring that you have the correct data. And of course, 
third, prevention, protection, and solutions. And last but not the least, this is always a trap that many governments fall into. And this is something that the international law on protection for IDPs is very clear that participation of internally displaced persons in decisions affecting them is actually very, very essential. I just would like to share as well that many other countries um, have actually been uh, uh, doing these laws and policies. I think you can see that, but there is also jurisprudence. And I have been very um, uh, privileged to participate in some of these courts uh, in the countries themselves as an international legal expert providing an amicus curiae on decisions concerning IDPs. So IDPs uh, law, main, main objective is protection of IDPs. And where is the source? The source is in lots of treaties and international customary law of, you know, of the world, human rights and international humanitarian law. And in 1998, we are very uh, lucky that these have all been compiled in the guiding principles on internal displacement. I actually checked and there is a translation into Bahasa. So you may want to look into this. And many of the guiding, princ the, the guiding principles as a whole is what we call soft law. Again, international lawyers know that. However, if you go principle by principle, you will see that majority of these principles are either part and parcel of the treaty obligations of your country and or already international customary rules that uh, are oblige, that, that states are obliged to follow, particularly those that are what we call use cogens, you know, really hard, hardcore um, uh, international customary law. This is just a slide to show you what it's all about. So you will see that it covers many aspects of IDP, of IDP protection. Okay, so I will not go into this because this is very um, uh, much more detailed, but I just would like to conclude that intern that protection of IDPs is governed by international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Some of the countries in the ASEAN have IHL laws, for example, but also many kinds of international human rights law, either as ratified treaties, as international customary law notions, or, and or as legal, as the domestic legislation. It's a responsibility of the state and best achieved in collaboration with the international community. I have spoken actually uh, with Aisher once on this, just to see how we can um, uh, engage on the implementation of IDP protection in the ASEAN. It requires, of course, IDP participation and IDP laws and policies based on international law should always aim to uphold international principles for protection, prevention, protection, and solutions to IDP situations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cecilia Jimenez-Lamari. Please give us, uh, uh, give uh, Ms. Cecilia a round of applause for her uh, a clear and concise uh, explanation about uh, internally displaced person, which I believe also that in Indonesia we have so many natural disasters as well and also other uh, events that might be uh, have a, a clearer uh, uh, understanding about uh, the difference between a refugee and internally displaced person. Because some in Bahasa, Miss Cecilia, we call it uh, with the same word, pengungsi. Ah. That's very interesting. Yeah, so Pugungse is same like for a refugee and also internally displaced person. But okay. with this kind of uh, uh, explanation, it will be much more clearer to uh, all of us here and also uh, uh, many people uh, around in Indonesia. Yeah. Unfortunately, the time is very limited. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but I just would like to say that in a way you may, may need to actually make it to be really more um, specific 
like maybe internal and international. Yes. Because what I'm just worried about is what you guys yeah. would say, drinking water while, while diving. Yeah. It's an Indonesian condition, yeah. I know. Yeah. Only yeah. in Indonesia can you come yeah. up with that, but that's about it. Yes, yes. I have a technical problem and I am trying to remove, ah, okay, screen sharing. I did All it. Right. Yes. Yes, Mrs. Cecilia, I just, want, I just want to add one more thing about your uh, suggestion. Actually, we do have a special uh, regulation, the presidential regulation on the refugee uh, management. So we call it as a foreign uh, refugee. So we call it pengungsi uh, asing as a refugee as, and pengungsi as an internally displaced person. So legally speaking, we do have that uh, differentiation. Perfect. Well, that's yeah. good to know. <laughs> Again, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, and hopefully we can meet uh, in person. Maybe you can, you can come down here to Jakarta or whatever, whenever, uh, wherever in, in Indonesia. Yeah. We, we certainly uh, would be glad to have you here uh, in person. And as thank the community so um, uh, uh, asked me to have a, a photo session, uh, despite that we are virtually, we, we do have a, a photo session. So maybe the committee can uh, um, lead on the, the photo session. Maybe everybody can turn on the video and also about the audience uh, and on campus, maybe. All right. So I can um, do the honor to count. One, two, three. Cheese. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Cheese. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Cecilia uh, Jimenez Damani, for your time and for your uh, insight. Uh, hopefully, we can meet in other time. Thank you very much. And now, uh, before we continue to the next session, I would uh, uh, give back to the uh, Master of Ceremony, Ms. Harto, Mr. Harto. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari Afriansa, for leading us in a keynote speech session. I'm sure that everyone must uh, get interesting point from presentation or from the speech by Ms. Cecilia Jimenez Damari, a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are entering the plenary session. In this session, we are privileged to have honorable invited speakers with us. Dr. Dani Suaraka Haryono, SHMH MBA, as Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. We also have Professor Hadrian Geri Jayadikerta from School of Business and Law, Edith Cowan University, Australia. And we also have Professor Dr. Ronald Holzecker from Faculty of Spatial Science, University of Groningen, Netherlands. And again, as our moderator, Dr. Ari Afriansa. Beside his job as a lecturer, Dr. Ari Afriansa, a father of two, is also an active researcher with numerous research published nationally and internationally. He is also sitting as editor-in-chief of the Indonesian Journal of International Law, Faculty of Law at the University of Indonesia. And he has won many scholarship and achievements. One of them was New Zealand Development Scholarship, or NZDS, from 2009 to 2013. Please, ladies and gentlemen, another warm welcome to Dr. Ari Afriansa. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Herto, for your kind, again, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the uh, plenary session of this afternoon, in which we are so privileged uh, to have three distinguished speakers uh, from Indonesia and uh, from uh, overseas outside Indonesia. So as mentioned uh, by the Master of Ceremony, we will have three 
uh, speakers. Uh, the first one is Dr. Daniswara K. Harjono. And second one is Professor Hadrian Gary Jaya Dikerta. And the third one is Professor Dr. Ronald Holzacker. Uh, and as the theme of today, I believe that uh, uh, speakers will talk around of ASEAN and especially with the integration of law. But for the first uh, 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 stage of the speakers, I would like to uh, introduce to you uh, the first speaker, Dr. Daniswara K. Harjono, SHMH MBA. Uh, he is the rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. And I would like to congratulate because uh, there's not so many university in Indonesia that has rector with the law background. So I congratulate the law faculty for having uh, Dr. Harjono for this one. Dr. Harjono uh, uh, previously uh, have a position as the vice rector of the uh, student affairs uh, at the same university. And he was, uh, he was, the lawyers uh, in a law firms and also now owning uh, his own law firms. And he also the uh, academic staff of the Universitas Christian Indonesia, where previously he also taught in Universitas Bakri uh, and also Jakarta Banking Institute. Besides as a lecturer, he is also a businessman uh, in which uh, as kind of a rare uh, experience in which he also uh, involved in a number of uh, uh, corporation. Uh, he wrote uh, many books and also articles in which in uh, legal affairs. And there are so many uh, experiences in a business organization. I guess without further ado, oh, before that, I would like to uh, uh, add more on his educational uh, uh, background. He holds a doctorate degree from Universitas Pajajaran in 2008. Uh, Master of Law, uh, Fakultas Hukum, uh, Universitas Pajajaran as well, and MBA from the Indonesia European University, Jakarta, Belgium in 1991, and uh, bachelor degree from uh, Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Dr. Harjono, uh, time is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adi Afiansa, as the moderator. First of all, I would like to say thank you to the Dean of Faculty of Law, which uh, give an uh, opportunity to me as an invited speaker, so I can speak today in this conference. My title is here is, I will talk about the ASEAN universities and its principles to work ASEAN legal integration in another era. The university country in ASEAN may be rising and across ASEAN source and exceptional level of political, cultural, and economic diversity. University is one of the components pulling in foreign investment into the region, which is imperative to be used as a vehicle for regional economic growth. With such diversity present through ASEAN, foreign investors are able to pick and choose which market among the ASEAN member states since the investment promotes is the best. For example, Indonesia has ASEAN's largest workforce with over 130 million workers and most of the population being under the age of 40. Some industries in Indonesia show great potential for foreign investment, including manufacturing, digital-based economy, and fast moving constant money goods. On the other hand, we have Malaysia, where on its way to becoming a medical hub in ASEAN, especially the proof of medical tourism attracting more than one, year, one million medical tourists in 2019. Here is an overview of foreign direct investment activities in ASEAN before the COVID-19 pandemic for the UNCAD ASEAN Investment Report 2019. In this slide, you can see the FDI growth in ASEAN in 2010 till 2018. You can see in the 2017 and 2018, this is the the, the increasing. And the 
we go to the next slide, you can see the top 10 investors in ASEAN in 2017 and 2018. Which in 2017, you can see the United States is become number two as uh, with a 17% share. But in 2018, the number two is become Japan uh, with a share 14%. In the next slide, you can see that about intra ASEAN investment by source country in 2017 and 2018. You can see Singapore. Singapore is the biggest. And the intra ASEAN investment by host country in 2017 to 2018. You can see Indonesia is the huge. So, the first partnership of the mixed markets in ASEAN plan ahead in to make ASEAN a robust market with active consumer and growing middle class. ASEAN has shown incredible accomplishment in economic terms, growing its combined GDP to five times it was in 2000 and is the world's fifth largest economy while being ASEAN's ASEAN as well as the largest. And it's projected to become number one in the world by 2017. However, following the high reforms in post in investment up until 2019, Southeast Asia has been greatly impacted by the pandemic. The region is experiencing a significant economic slowdown, including a significant disruption of production and supply chains in many industries. Not to mention about the long issues leading to factors stopping production activities. Factory operation in ASEAN in the automotive, electric, electronic and apparel industries are also likely to be majorly scaled down due to the lack of or massive decrease in the global and the regional demand. Second quarter, the GDP number for ASEAN, measured on year on year basis, are displaying global digit yearly decline across the world. The ASEAN Development Bank has progressively downgraded its full year 2020 GDP forecast for the region and now expect 3.8% of our contraction. Here are several factors that could have contributed to why the pandemic has so negatively impacted in ASEAN. First, less effective pandemic response. ASEAN's pandemic containment measures admittedly fell in comparison to some other countries or region. Second, the strong tourism dependence. Some countries in ASEAN really rely on the new travel tourism industry due to travel plans and quarantine measures. The third, a lack of tech exposure. The tech industry has been the year's most robust performing sector. However, the general operation of ASEAN globally has little exposure to this sector. My apology, uh, Dr. Harjono. Uh, it seems that we have a technical difficulties. Uh, your voice is not clear. So maybe uh, is there a committee can maybe uh, uh, fix a little bit the technical uh, things? Okay. Here. Can we try again? Uh, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, it seems, yeah, it's not quite clear. Okay. Yes, is it okay? It's too much echo, but. Too much. Okay. Is it okay? Is it okay? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. A little bit, just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can continue. 
uh, apologize to the audience. Maybe this is the best uh, uh, technical things that we can uh, have right now. Please continue, uh, Dr. Harjono. Okay. Sorry about the microphone. Policy makers in ASEAN are aware that this is currently more important than ever to advance regional integration. Remain committed to an open and rules based regional economic development. As well as build a more resilient and integrated ASEAN supply chain. Economic integration can be done through free trade agreements and other international legal instruments, be it hard law and soft law, which would lead to a legal harmonization, even unification. In making, in making effort toward regular economic integration, discussion on regional legal harmonization are inescapable. Some cross border trade of goods and services is key to making ASEAN into one integrated market favorable to foreign investment, which can only be done through the right policies and the proper legal instrument. In order for legal harmonization to go through, ASEAN must overcome the obstacles put forth by the diversified nature of the region. This is where diversified may also be close to ASEAN. Diversity is not always put in a light that solves this is a puzzle, where the different puzzle pieces come together to complement each other and create a bigger picture. More often than not, diversify the possibility highlight the differences between ASEAN nation and become the starting line of conflicts. The difficulties in finding consensus on the pace and scale of ASEAN economic integration have frequently been attributed to ASEAN diversity. Despite the gaps of economic cooperation and integration, significant gaps still remain. Different production and export mechanism, as well as commercial policies, represent such diversity in ASEAN region. Its ASEAN member state has its own distinct identity, which is rooted in its own history, politics, and culture. These elements become points of contention among ASEAN member states, causing them to disagree on a variety of issues, especially when it comes to deciding policy steps to boost economic growth and legal integration in the region. As a result, ASEAN must define its regional identity, which is critical to forming a community level economic, social, cultural, and political security in the nature. The ASEAN founders and ambition themselves are part of the collectivity and banking or region that draws a shared historical heritage and online common goods. In protecting ASEAN's own cohesion and identity, it faces a number of challenges. One, you can see domestic security challenges that all jeopardize regional unity and identity. Second, nationalism, which will continue to be a strong force. Third, despite the existence of the framework of ASEAN societal cultural community, there is a disconnect between the official ASEAN and the ASEAN of the people. In order to make, to make the ordinary people in ASEAN identify with the regional identity, more interaction and identification at the common level would be needed to develop the true regional identity and for interstate disputes. One step taken toward dealing with the pandemic by ASEAN as a colleague is the ASEAN White South Certification Scheme recently implemented on 20 September 2020. Instead of 
according to the relative benefit possibility. If only requires minus the to start declare the origin of the, of the export. It is expected to have to have a good repetitivity and resistance of supply chains by reducing friction in local rate. This ASEAN wide self certification scheme is the form of ASEAN active under the regional identity in dealing with the COVID 19 pandemic. While there are distinctions among ASEAN member states, there are also some communities in the regional cultures. ASEAN nations place a high priority on social peace and consensus. This may also factor into the rationale behind ASEAN countries relying to create legal harmonization tools despite strong feeling of nationalism and paper diversity. This slide, this, this last slide, this shows that it is necessary to understand that the containment and ending of the COVID-19 pandemic is the common goal of ASEAN as a region. In dealing with it, we must face, we must fight against it, and we must pass it. We shall ensure that the economic crisis imposed the pandemic doesn't lead to political and social crisis. ASEAN has experienced crisis and dark times together. Thus, it is, it is without doubt that we can pass this pandemic as well. Well, this pandemic has indeed many plans straight for ASEAN. What we can do now that uh, to take advantage of what we have, including and despite our data city to overcome this. Especially in utilizing the digital tools that influence the people of ASEAN. Especially in Europe, the connect with one another and growth sense of regional identity and sense of belonging in ASEAN. It is true our sense of regional identity as one ASEAN region, made up by our respective national identities, that we may overcome this pandemic together. Thank you, and many God bless us all. I give back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Daniswara Harjono. Please, uh, give uh, Dr. Harjun a round of applause for his uh, presentation. And I'm, I'm very sorry about the technical uh, problems. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, you can still, uh, if, you can, if you cannot hear uh, clearly, you can still uh, uh, see the, the slides. And I think it's quite clear of uh, Dr. Harjun's uh, uh, points in which I found it very interesting in which uh, I can highlight here that an ASEAN is actually have a, a, a strength uh, to have integration. We do have a, a culture, uh, history, and also the, uh, the, the things that can be together. However, however, as Dr. Harjona has mentioned and identified, we have at least four challenges uh, to have uh, ASEAN integration. The first one is the domestic security challenges. Yeah? And the second one is over nationalism. And the, th and the third one is a disconnect between the official ASEAN and ASEAN people themselves. And lastly, interstate disputes in which this kind of things that we need to uh, 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 pull together and uh, resolve together. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harjuna, for your presentation. And we will continue uh, later on with the uh, question and answer. But now uh, I would like to uh, invite our second uh, speakers, Associate Professor Had Hadrian, G. Jaya Dikerta. Uh, Dr. Hadrian G. Jaya Dikerta is a, an associate professor of strategic management accounting in the School of Business and Law at Edith Cowan University. He has over two decades of research, teaching, and leadership in academia, including associate dean research, head of discipline, MBA director, and leader of research group roles. He has previously held academic positions 
at the University of New South Wales, Lincoln University, and the University of Technology, Sydney. He has also been a management consultant for enterprises and governmental departments, an experienced researcher with numerous referred publications and more than a dozen completed supervised PhD students. He has received more than $1 million in research grant and received numerous accolades, including Vice Chancellor's Excellence in Research Supervision Award and Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. He is also the co-founder and the Vice President of the ASEAN Chamber of Commerce Incorporation and Vice President of Indonesia in Institute Incorporation in Perth. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you wish to have uh, to listen in Bahasa or in English, you can use the channel which uh, 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 provided uh, in the bar uh, underneath uh, at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen. Professor Jaya Dikerta, time is yours, roughly 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Afriansha. Good afternoon, Dr. Harjono, Rector of Uki. Good afternoon, my fellow speaker, Professor Hosakra from University of Grand Groningen, Netherlands. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, may I please also introduce that I am originally Indonesian. I'm still origin Indonesian. I can speak Bahasa still very well, right? But in this international law, which is congratulate, I, I send my congratulations right to your first international law conference. We will actually discuss things obviously in English. So uh, can I share my screen at the moment? Yes, please. Okay, so it can be seen, I believe, clearly? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much again for having me in this conference as a plenary, speak plenary speaker. My topic for today's session would be insights into modern slavery in global supply chains. As you have heard from uh, Dr. Afriansha, I'm not a lawyer, but my background is not law. My background is uh, accounting and engineering. So I both accountants and industrial engineers. But in my work and my research, I actually do a lot of things in relation to global supply chain. And within that context of global supply chains, modern slavery is something that obviously significant. Now, the context of uh, modern slavery in, the, in my discussion will cover obviously aspects of law and regulation as well. And because it's actually global aspect of supply chains that I discuss, I will, it will probably more or discussion on international perspective, but there will be aspects of ASEAN obviously that will be discussed as well. So hopefully uh, after the discussion, you get some insights from, from what I actually will present at the moment. So let's start. So the first thing that we, the word, the first word that, in the that is in the title is slavery. So I think when we hear the word slavery, normal people usually think that this is something that happened in the past, something ancient, something that supposedly doesn't happen anymore in today's environment. Or at least if it does happen, the magnitude of the scale of slavery in today's environment won't be that huge, won't be that big, right? So if we actually look at the definition, I just have, I just take one of the definition from Encyclopedia Britannica. Slavery is a condition in which one human being was owned by another. A slave were considered by law as property or cattle and was deprived of most of the rights ordinarily held by free person. So the definition itself shows that this is something that supposedly doesn't happen anymore, right? So as a test, a simple test, if you actually go into Google and then just type slavery, right? And then you search, right? Search images, right? This is what I did just now, right? This afternoon, you will find pictures, right? Images that portray incident, if you like, right? That happened in the past. So obviously we think, hey, this is actually happened in the past. We don't actually experience this anymore, right? Supposedly. But the reality is that is still actually well and alive. Okay, so 
until 1990s, people didn't think much about the ideas of slavery, right? So, or modern slavery, if you like, right? But then in 1992, I just actually bring you back, right, to 1992, there was an article in Harper, Harper Magazine, sorry, right? Harper Magazine, let's zoom it a bit more, right? So in August, 1992, a report made by Jeff Ballinger, this is, he is actually a workers' right advocate who spent three and a half years in Indonesia working for AFL-CIO's Asian Institute. And his, in his article, he actually highlighted this issue. Right, let's, we can actually read this together. I believe we can read it now. So her only name is Sadisa. It's safe to say that he's never heard of Michael Jordan nor she is, is she spending her evening watching him and his Olympic teammates gliding and dunking in prime time from Barcelona. But she has heard of the shoe company he endorses, Nike, whose logo can be seen on the shoes and uniforms of many American Olympics athletes this summer. Like Jordan, Sadisa works on behalf of Nike. You won't see her, however, in the flashy TV images of freedom and individually that's smugly command us to just do it, just spend upward of $130 for a pair of basketball shoes. Yet Sadisa is in fact one of the people who is doing it, making the actual shoes. That is, and earning paycheck as such this one in a factory in Indonesia. So then you can see one example of the paycheck there, right? And this is the interesting thing. Right. So if you actually look at this, pendapatan is the earning column there, and the five lines below the, pay, uh, the base pay figures for the month, 50,400 rupees, is one for overtime. Right. So if you read through, Sadisa worked 63 hours of overtime during this pay period, for which she received an extra two cents per hour. Right. At this factory, which makes mid price Nikes. Each pair of shoes requires 0.84 man hour to produce. And at the end, the labor cost to manufacture a pair of Nikes that sells for $80 in the US is approximately 12 cents. So you can imagine right? when people actually read this story, there are, if you like, outrage, right? uproar everywhere. People made complain about the ideas of Nike actually had sweatshops across Asia, right? Basically making shoes with a very, very cheap labor, right? And then sell it with a high, very, very high profit margin. So that's what, that is what happened, right? In 1992, okay? Now, now Nike then did something, right? Basically provided their argument, et cetera, et cetera. But then, right in 1996, Life Magazine showed a picture Still Nike, right? That a boy in Pakistan actually did this, right? Manufacturing process for Nike. So in 1996, again, there is outrage, uproar. And the good thing about these incidents are that people started to aware the reality of slavery in today's society, right? So people basically started to think, hey, slavery turned out to be exists. Right, it's actually a lot thing going on in terms of slavery in our uh, supply chain. So this is the, if you like, the first time, if you like, that people are getting more aware about this modern slavery. So the, the term modern slavery that then emerged starting that time, right? So modern slavery. So if you actually did, again, same thing, right? You go to Google and then just type modern slavery and then search the images. Right, and then you'll find images such as this, right? And then you can actually see different things, right? If you actually compare it with just slavery, then you can actually see now that people now aware, right? A lot of people aware in terms of the existence of slavery, right? In modern day, if you like, right? So the word modern is inserted and become a new term nowadays, right? Modern slavery, okay. 
Modern slavery, if we basically want to get a general definition of it, is the severe exploitation of other people for personal or commercial gain. So the, the, the important word is, is exploitation, right, by other people, right, for personal or commercial gain, right? So then the data shows, the latest data that we can find, that we can find from uh, international labor organization is that 40.3 million people in the world were in modern slavery. In, uh, in 2016, okay? Among these 40.3 million people in the world, 24.9 million people uh, in the world were in forced labor. And this contributed to the generation of 150 billion in illegal profits for private companies. So now you can actually see that the magnitude is huge, right? The scale of this modern slavery nowadays is really, really huge. So if people actually don't actually realize and don't actually try to think this as a something that must be tackled, then we basically leave a lot something that is actually horrible going on, right, continuously going on. Okay, so if we actually go into more details about the numbers, right, 40.3 million, right, people in modern slavery in 2016, if we got the data, we get the data from Global Slavery Index in 2018. They actually now details that more, a bit more. 71% of these 40.3 millions were women, right? The remaining of them were men, right? So now they also give some discussion, if you like, right, or uh, illustration, right, about which country that actually do a lot more than the others. So they put a scale from, again, they color it from white to really dark red there. White represents low and really dark red over here is represents really high level or prevalence of modern slavery. So you can actually see that if you look at in the, the, the graph in details, you can actually see that most countries that actually have high or dark reds are African countries right, and Asian countries, right, over here, then over here, including Southeast Asia, there, right. So then we actually look at probably definition, another definition, right, I just took another one, right, from Home Affairs, uh, Australian Home Affairs government uh, website. Modern slavery describes situation where offenders use coercion, threats or deception to exploit victims and undermine their freedom. And practices that constitute modern slavery can include human trafficking, slavery, servitude, servitude uh, forced labor, debt bondage, forced marriage, and the worst form of child labor, All right? That, these are examples of modern slavery right, in today's environment. Now, modern slavery is something that does exist. But since the nature of modern slavery is, is cunning, right? It's, it's tricky, right? And it makes it commonly unreported or at least underreported. And it is difficult really to detect, all right? And universally, there is yet a great legal definition of modern slavery. This is understandable because if we actually look at the, this, our world, there are so many jurisdictions, obviously. There are so many nations, there are so many countries. There are so many jurisdictions that actually have their own, obviously, legal right, frameworks and actually make an agreed definition right, for modern slavery become very, very tricky. Okay. Now, even in those countries, that, start, that have started to include or develop really framework for legal framework for modern slavery, the legislation still refers to the criminal code and a variety of different protocols, codes, and convention. I'll give you an example of one that actually in Australia, right? Australia's Modern Slavery Act 2018, Commonwealth one, right? So modern slavery means conducts which would constitute an offense under Division 270 or 271 of the criminal code, including that bondage, forced labor, servitude, right, decept deceptive recruiting for labor or services, and forced marriage, trafficking in person, 
or the worst form of child labor. So even with within a country that has its own modern slavery act, the definition still refer to the criminal code, right? And, and variety of other protocols, codes, and convention. But there is no really clear definition in terms of what modern slavery actually is, right? So what I want to show you as well is the key treaties and laws that re relevant to modern slavery. So the context of modern slavery, if we actually refer to the international labor organizations, they have what they call as protocol of the 2014 to the forced labor convention, 1930 right, the P029. If you go to article one, you can read that uh, they say that in giving effect to its obligation under the convention to suppress force or compulsory labor, each member shall take effective measures to prevent and eliminate its use to provide to victims protection and access, access to appropriate and effective remedies such as compensation and to sanction the perpetrators of force or compulsory labor. So international labor organization has this protocol. They also has this supplementary measures, right? R0, uh, R203, recommendation 2014 number 203. And if you go and look at article number three, it says members should take preventive measures that include respecting, promoting, and realizing fundamental principle, right, and rights at the works. The promotion of freedom of association and collective bargaining to enable at risk workers to join workers' organizations, programs to combat discrimination that heightens vulnerability to force or compulsory labor, initiatives to address child labor and promote educational opportunity for children both boys and girls as a safeguard against children becoming victims of force or compulsory labor and taking steps to realize the objectives of the protocol and the convention. So they try already put these ideas of modern slavery into right, their uh, protocols right, and their supplementary measures. United Nations, right, they have guiding principles on business and human rights. Right, they have this in 2011. So guideline number two on the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. If you go to fund, uh, foundational principle uh, A11, you can read that business enterprises should respect human rights, right? And then the responsibility, if you go to the A13, right? The responsibility to respect human rights requires that business enterprises avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impact through their own activities and address such impacts when they occur and also seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impact that are directly linked to their operation, products or services by their business relationships, even if they have not contributed to those impact. Right? So if you go still within the context of United Nations, right, they develop already what they call by sustainable development goals. And if you focus on goals number five, general equality and goals number eight, decent work and economic growth, you will find these two targets in them. Right? Target five, two, eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. And target number 8.7 is take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, right? And end modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst form of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers and by 2025 and child laborers in all its form. So, so many organizations, International Labor Organization, United Nations have started doing something about this modern slavery issue. How about countries? How many countries that actually now, <clears throat> if you like, develop or their own law Right, or acts, if you like. At the moment, there are four countries, US, uh, UK, France, and Australia. Even in the US, it's not really actually the whole country, but it's just California states that actually has this, California Transparency in Supply Chains Act 2010. 
<clears throat> they covered businesses which are doing businesses in California with a worldwide gross receipt exceeding 100 million and are identified as manufacturers or retail sellers on their California state tax return. They have to disclose the extent of effort in verification, audit certification, internal accountability, and training. It is endorsed by California uh, office, Tony Pan review of the company's website and compliance with the requirement that's the sanction and responses to violation is an action of injunctive relief. That's California Transparency in Supply Chains Act 2010. UK developed their own act, Modern Slavery Act 2015, Right, they, they focus on commercial organization, which supplies goods and services, and has a total turnover not less than $36 million in bound by this provision. Right? And then the duty of this organization that are affected by this act is to prepare a slavery and a human trafficking statement for each financial statement. Right? The sanction that if they fail to comply, the Secretary of State may obtain an order to seek compliance. If the order is ignored, it could result in contempt and be subjected to a fine. So United Kingdom has that in 2015. So imagine, so starting in the year 2000, if you like, right now, only people become more aware. Uh, countries also become actually probably forced to become more pro, uh, responsible and four of these countries right, started to develop their own right, act in relation to modern slavery. France uh, developed its own duty of vigilance 2017, right? and it applies to parent and subcontracting companies of large French companies. And the duty is for the companies to assess and address the adverse impact of their business activities and publish this annually with public vigilance plans. Failure to complain will result in the companies be fined up to $10 million when plans are not published and up to 30 million if the failure results in damages. So the last one that, uh, the latest one as well is Australia. Right? Modern Slavery Act 2018, right? And it was effective in 2019. Right, the coverage is the entities based on operating in Australia, which with an annual consolidated revenue of more than one hundred million dollars. And the Sorry, duty is Professor Hadrian, uh, yeah. five more minutes. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the duty is to report annually on the risk of modern slavery in their operation and supply chain and action to address those risks. So those who actually not comply will have a, a remedial action. Right. So. They started in 2019 and they actually got this, if you like, uh, plan that ne they need to follow, start from designing, right, the, and implement the modern slavery management framework, assessing, mitigate, remediate, right, monitor, and then report that, right? Okay, so all the reports are recorded in the Australian Border website, uh, Border Force website. Uh, since 2019, there are now uh, 1,368 entities that are affected by this reporting requirement, right? Some of them actually did it voluntary as well. So if you go to this website there, you can actually see examples of the modern slavery statements made by organization in Australia. Okay, so I just wanna, I have a few more slides just to complete the, dis uh, the discussion, right? So if you go to Global Slavery Index and then you download the reports, you will find a lot of information there, right? So you, you download the report, you will find the Global Slavery Index 2018. And this is, I just wanna show, this is one of the important bit that problem is that, and is ironically, if you actually look at countries that actually got really high prevalence of modern slavery, which are more on, in the, on the African continent and the Asian continent, uh, you can also see how their government responded, right? And then you can actually see that the response, the government response in terms of this issue are still very, very low, right? So these are the countries that actually has have least action in terms of modern slavery, and this is actually the most active country. So it is very, very ironic that still happened, right? And actually makes the complexity in terms of tackling the issue. 
So region of Africa got this estimated people in modern slavery, 23% in total for, from global estimates, but Asia right, got 62%, right, 24 million, right, 990,000 estimated right in 2016. So if you go into the highlights, right, these are the uh, Africans highlights, right? And a lot of country are still actually got a lot of modern slavery happening right over there. Asia, right, including Southeast Asia, also got a lot of problems there, right? So this issue is not something that need to be, can be neglected. It needs to be tackled really, really well, right? So another uh, index that you can probably see if you like is the Varix Mapplethorpe Modern Slavery Index. And this is the, 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 the illustration, if you like, the latest one that actually show the index based on Asian data, right? So, okay, so we did research as well, right? So I worked with my few of my colleagues and actually tried to find what's actually the reasons for this modern slavery. And there are many factors that contribute, right? So the first one is the supply chain industry two factors that probably within the context of control of companies, right? And there are many aspects of that, right? But then we got regulation issue as well. And this actually obviously out, the, uh, out of the uh, control of companies is actually more on the government side that actually handle this one. But then this is actually something that cannot be avoided. The geographical area production in located in conflict zones, for example, that's actually triggered to higher level of modern slavery and isolation as well. And the more complex one that we found is these two categories or factors, socioeconomics and culture and tradition, right? Poverty, unemployment, low wages, language barriers, social acceptance of worker expectation, discrimination, religious beliefs, all contribute to the really actually complexity of modern slavery across countries. So, so across industries, usually, right, we find that practice of modern slavery tends to be more prevalent in certain industry compared to others, especially in those with high labor intensity, agriculture, for example, mining, construction, and some form of manufacturing. So global collaboration has been made. For example, Australian ASEAN launched a 10 years counter trafficking initiatives in 2019, for example. So efforts continue to be made. So these are the key insights. My last slides for today is that modern slavery is well and alive. It is dynamic and it's often difficult to identify many factors contributing to modern slavery. Competing economic needs of parties at both the supply and demand side are the major enables, enablers for modern slavery. Lack of good governance, lack of effective laws and regulation are also major challenges to the complexity in dealing with modern slavery. But lastly, Right, this is actually the complexity of tackling world slavery issues is also exacerbated by the cultural and traditions and socioeconomic factors. And this is actually the thing that very, very, very complex to deal with. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Afrian Shah. Right, I return the, the, the slides now or the session right to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hadrian. Please uh, ask give to uh, Professor Hadrian a round of applause for his uh, presentation, in which, again, very uh, important and timely because uh, I believe uh, every one of us here in Indonesia aware very much about the problems of modern slavery. As we know that uh, we experienced uh, many uh, these events uh, happens to our uh, uh, Indonesians that work in the fishing industries overseas uh, and many uh, the news uh, came to our uh, television showing that how how difficult uh, the life uh, to become a, a fishing crew uh, overseas and what has been uh, 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 inside by uh, Professor Hadrian that not only in the fishing industry but in every aspect of the uh, economic activities in which it creates uh, another uh, challenges for uh, uh, the life of human in this planet. And that's why uh, the UN uh, guiding principles on, on, on business and human rights becomes one of the key factor uh, for the businessmen to, uh, to adhere to this uh, so-called soft laws. However, however, we are still in the face of the challenges of the, this mechanism on how we 
have to ensure that this uh, so-called company, the parents company, and also the, the companies uh, all over the world uh, be abide by this uh, human rights standard so that uh, everyone uh, that doing their job uh, protected by the bare basic uh, human rights. I believe so many uh, questions that will be given to you, uh, Professor Hadrian. However, there is another yet a very distinguished uh, speakers from the Netherlands, Professor Dr. Ronald Holzacker, uh, my apology for my pronunciation, uh, Professor Ronald. Uh, Professor Ronald is uh, coming from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, Professor of Comparative Multilevel Governance and Regional Structure in the Faculty of Spatial Science, Department of Spatial Planning and Environment, and the Faculty of Arts, Department of International Relations and International Organizations. He holds a PhD from the University of Michigan in Political Science, and a JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. He is broadly interested in questions of governance, human rights, and the interaction between civil society organizations and institutions in political system. He is founding director of the Groningen Research Center in the Southeast Asia and ASEAN, Southeast Asia ASEAN, located in Groningen and Gajah Mada University, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. He leads an interdisciplinary teams of scholars and 20 uh, PhD researchers engage in theoretical driven comparative research focused on governance, social, societal impact and sustain, sustainable society in Southeast Asia. He published uh, many articles, uh, journals, and also a number of books uh, in which uh, relevant to his expertise. And uh, I can note it here that the C ASEAN Center has been recently awarded an Erasmus Plus grant from the EU as part of the BRECIL consortium to improve the capacity con to conduct social science research in Southeast Asia. Speci specifically, the Brazil aims to develop human and social capital to facilitate individual learning and institutional mechanism in social science research in higher education institution in Malaysia and Laos. The grant will allow Southeast Asia ASEAN to play a key role in facilitating capacity building and research governance in the region. I am looking forward to your presentation. Professor Ronald, time is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon uh, across uh, Indonesia and uh, Southeast Asia. It's uh, morning here in the, in the Netherlands. Um, Dr. Ari, I uh, wish you a happy birthday uh, again. Um, it's an honor to share the stage uh, with your uh, rector uh, this morning and also with uh, Professor Hadrian and also earlier with the uh, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Cecilia Jimenez. Um, you know, during uh, Cecilia's presentation, it really... Um, can you hear me? I got a message. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, her earlier presentation reminded me of the uh, special situation happening now in Myanmar with uh, internally displaced persons, um, both in terms of the Rohingya crisis in the state of Rakhine, but also the human rights crisis going on now across the country. So I think that um, uh, when we're talking about ASEAN, uh, solidarity than the situation in Myanmar now is on all of our minds. Okay, if you could put up my uh, first slide, please. The committee? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about the power of law for implementation. I'm interested in sort of this intersectionality between certain climate treaties um, and the sustainable development goals. Those were things that uh, Professor Adrian also had mentioned in the last presentation and the human rights agendas. So I'm interested in the intersection between these uh, agendas and specifically wanna to talk to you about some 
research that we're proposing to do, looking at corridor development in Indonesia. So for example, uh, in uh, Kalimantan, linking the new capital to uh, provincial uh, smaller towns near there, or if you think about the corridor between Jakarta and, and Bandung. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here's our conference today, uh, focusing on law and human rights. Next slide, please. Yeah, so once again, I'm the director of our Groningen Research Center for Southeast Asia and, and ASEAN. Uh, you see here in our logo, it is a bridge. It's the longest bridge in Southeast Asia. So for us, this represents the link between the different uh, uh, focus of our uh, research. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention that one of the organizers today, Professor Edward uh, Pinjenton, he was a uh, gr graduate of our PhD program here in Groningen, so I'm very glad to be invited today by him. Okay, thank you. Next slide. I want to first look back at a, a World Bank report from 2011 that sort of uh, goes into some of these connections between human rights and climate change. I mean, one of the focuses of the conference today is on the worldwide uh, health pandemic, but of course there is also an ongoing and continuing uh, human rights uh, climate change uh, emergency. So this uh, report from the World Bank sort of sets out a three-part conceptual framework making this link. So first of all, climate change may impact the enjoyment of human rights. Um, so for example, when I was hearing the presentation by the UN Special Rapporteur, I thought about, well, um, some people are displaced because of immediate emergencies, for example, uh, uh, flood issues that may be caused by climate change, but other people may be driven out of their, let's say, rural area because of a drought or long-term environmental changes, and they also may then be uh, displaced persons. Um, a second is measures to address climate change may impact the realization of human rights. Um, so for example, if uh, people who are fleeing areas that are um, facing drought, they may find themselves settling along riverbanks, um, which then also are uh, prone to um, a disaster. So we're interested in protecting the most vulnerable. And when we're addressing climate change, we need to think about the impact that that has on uh, human rights. And finally, the third issue here is human rights have relevance to policy and operational responses to climate change. So we remember that human rights obligations, there are both substantive and procedural. So for example, we want to um, consult with civil society organizations about how they think that their uh, village or town or neighborhood is impacted and a good response to, to them. Okay, next slide, please. Here are some advantages presented by the World Bank of taking this human rights frame when we talk about the, a climate dialogue. And I think this underscores the power of law. Human rights places the individual at the center of the inquiry and focuses the range of human rights protected by law on the individual. But second, this idea of but buttressing vulnerable communities and countries' claims for international assistance are underscored by the human rights treaties. And finally, the human rights perspective empowers marginalized groups and strength strengthens the accountability for delivery on adaptation measures through the focus on obligations. So we know that international treaties are mainly 
between nation states. But if we take a human rights frame when we're implementing these, it gives special rights to individuals and communities and the most vulnerable. Okay, next slide, please. One of the things I find interesting, um, my earlier work really focused on human rights and I have moved to more of a focus now on the sustainable development goals. So these are the global goals 2030. And one of the th websites I find interesting is the Danish Institute for Human Rights has found that between 90 and 95% of the, um, of the human rights uh, uh, law and agreements are also found in one way or the another in the sustainable development goals. So there's quite a link and overlap here. And th this website allows one to sort of show and see the, the linkages there. And remember, because the human rights law sometimes gives you access to the court system to try to enforce those which isn't the case under the sustainable development goals. There are voluntary you know, national uh, targets and objectives, but you can also use the human rights law to try to enforce these. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to briefly introduce you to some uh, new research that I'm doing uh, with uh, Bobby Situan at the Gajamada University and this idea of sustainable corridor development. So we're asking ourselves how best to design and govern sustainable urban transformation, but as part of a broader ecosystem of um, sustainable uh, development for the corridor in times of rapid climate change. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the five corridors that we have selected to uh, focus on, um, spread across uh, Indonesia. So not just Java, but also uh, areas outside of Java as well. Okay, next slide, please. One of the things we first do is look at the existing uh, literature on the benefits of looking at corridor development. And a lot of the focus here has been about fostering economic growth. Um, but our perspective is you can also look at a corridor, for example, in terms of delivering health services. So, um, you know, we want our local doctor, our general practitioner, our house doctor to be very close to us, but we also want to be able to reach larger clinics or offering specialty care or hospitals. So you can think of a corridor and it should be developed in a way to think about how health services are delivered across the corridor, also how, how education is delivered. So you want elementary schools for the smallest children to be quite close to the home, but you want to also be able to reach um, trade schools or universities um, nearby within a corridor. Okay, next slide, please. A lot of the focus on um, corridors has been on infrastructure and either high-speed rail, for example, between Jakarta and Bandung or in uh, superhighways, but we're saying we should conceive of them more in terms of uh, development. Okay, next slide, please. This is a picture of the uh, Trans Sumatra uh, toll road. So we want to move away from just this conception of transport as a corridor, but wider development in line with uh, climate change. Okay, next slide. So today, you know, we're talking about these links between the international and the regional like uh, ASEAN and provincial government and local government. So we're interested in this shift from the international treaties, for example, the International Paris Climate Change Agreements, and 
how those are reflected in the nationally determined commitments, the NDCs to reduce greenhouse emissions. And we're also interested in how we move from these global goals, the sustainable development goals, to national action plans. So it's a multi-level uh, equation. Concepts of building cities that are resilient and can respond to changes in climate can be found in SDG 11, which suggests cities should combine and integrate adaptation with a broader view of the surrounding ecosystem and disaster risk reduction. Okay, next slide, please. I next want to introduce you to some of the Indonesian national and provincial level uh, legal and policy documents in this uh, area. Okay, next slide, please. So for example, uh, Indonesia, like other countries, will prepare a voluntary national review of its progress toward making the reaching the 2030 uh, goals. Um, and this is a very interesting document about 80 pages about uh, how Indonesia selected their targets and the indicators to meet the SDGs and um, what is the next steps. Okay, next document, please. This, for example, is a uh, from a, a slide presentation that the um, Bapanis, your planning ministry, um, uh, prepared. And basically the Global Goals 2030 is integrated into your um, uh, medium term uh, development uh, program. Um, and this shows then that the main challenge is ensuring in inclusive growth and shared prosperity for all. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so you also see this then at the provincial level that they also have their um, uh, plans. Um, and that's very interesting for us in terms of our focus on corridors because what we are interested is working with policymakers on this interaction between um, cities and the provincial level of government. Okay, next slide, please. Um, if one looks at some of the early literature, for example, by the Asian Development Bank, you see this focused on economic corridors. Um, and it focuses on moving people and goods. So we see that emphasis again on transport needs. We'll go to the next slide, please. So here I wanted to uh, show you this sort of theor theoretical shift we're interested in uh, making. We want to move away from just the idea of economic corridors to SDG development cor corridors and a focus on people. So a lot of the earlier literature talked about the corridors connect economic agents. And we say, well, corridors can also connect people with diverse needs, social needs, indeed economic needs, but also environment needs and, um, and things related to their uh, climate. Um, uh, second, the earlier emphasis has been on economic geography for economic integration, and we want a broader view of the geography that you should look at healthcare, educational opportunities, cultural opportunities along the corridor. So we see that corridors offer the opportunity for reducing inequality and it makes sure that economic resources, health and education are tied closer to the 2030 global goals. Okay, next slide, please. One of the things that I find quite interesting about the sustainable development goals is you see these sort of social goals in the first line, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, health and well-being. 
Um, then you see some of these more economic oriented ones, decent work, uh, industry, innovation, infrastructure, um, consumption. But you also see now on the third line there, these environmental ones, climate action, life below water, life on land. So I think instead of seeing it as we have these separate treaties on um, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and we have the global goals, it's good to have an integrated um, concept. You know, if you are a city planner or if you're a provincial uh, planner, then you need to come up with comprehensive plans. You can't have these various agendas that may be in conflict. So the, we think that the SDG framework allows one to think across these different goals facing communities and corridors. Next slide, please. So in our research, we talk about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, you know that the next uh, conference is going to be in Glasgow on that. Uh, we also rely on the Global Center on Adaptation, which is headquartered in both Rotterdam and Groningen, and their recent, recent report, Adapt Now, a Global Call for Leadership on Climate Resistance. It's also a part of the new urban agenda that is being developed by uh, the UN. And this is something that Bobby Situan has been very in involved with uh, as well. Okay, next slide, please. So we take a transdisciplinary -dis approach. Um, I am a lawyer, but um, with my uh, Juris Doctor, but I also, you know, my main scholarly focus has been in the area of uh, political science. Okay, next. Um, so you see here that, you know, the focus is on sustainable cities, but we're interested in these various impacts that are um, impacting cities, changes in climate, uh, environmental concerns, but also uh, economic. Um, there are various branches of the academy that focus on these scientific questions, but we're also interested in the societal aspirations and the societal impact of our research. And you can see some of those here about equal access, uh, poverty reduction, food security. Okay, next slide, please. Sorry, Professor, uh, yes. five more minutes. Yes, these I will go through very quickly. I just wanted to briefly introduce you to the, um, the five corridors that we are proposing to study. Um, the first one here is in uh, on Northern Sumatra and the connecting Maidan to Toba Lake. Okay, next slide, uh, please. Um, there you see it on, uh, on, a, on a map, and this is part of uh, your President Chikawi's National Priority Program. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, another one is the uh, corridor between Jakarta and uh, Bandung, a much more urban uh, and an increasingly urbanized uh, corridor. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is a, a map that you're obviously very familiar with and the connection between Jakarta and Bandung. Um, by the way, I, the first time I traveled that route was about uh, 25 years ago and I took the train, a very uh, beautiful uh, slow train at that point. And of course now the uh, high-speed train is being uh, placed on that uh, corridor. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the next corridor is the corridor um, connecting Jogjakarta with Samarang and uh, Solo. Next slide, please. And there you see how it is also um, connecting Jogjak slide, please. And this is the new uh, Indonesian uh, capital corridor corridor on Kalimantan and connecting the newly founded uh, capital there with existing smaller towns and also the coast and uh, harbor. 
Okay, next slide, please. There you see it on Kalimantan. Next slide, please. And then finally, a coastal corridor in South Sulawesi, um, which has important uh, dynamics between uh, fishery and uh, environmental uh, preservation and also an important agro uh, industry. Okay, next slide, uh, please. And there you see it um, on the map. Okay, next slide, please. And there you see then the, the five corridors where we are gonna be looking at the legal framework and the policy framework and the implementation of these sort of uh, dueling agendas of the climate change agenda and how cities and provinces can respond and the Global Goals 2030. All right, if we could turn off the uh, slideshow and I just wanted to show um, a couple of our earlier um, uh, books on uh, ASEAN and the Sustainable Development Goals. So um, this was uh, a book that I uh, edited together with Dafri Agusalam at Gajamada University on Sustainable Development Goals in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. And um, this is our latest book on challenges of government um, that also has uh, ASEAN involved. And, um, you know, our uh, say ASEAN, uh, yesterday we had a meeting with your Indonesian uh, ambassador to the Netherlands, um, Ambassador Meyerfuss, and we've ha we have over 300 Indonesian students in our university at the bachelor and master and PhD level, and um, uh, we are also very welcome to receive a PhD uh, proposals. Um, we have good uh, success with funding through LPDP, your national scholarship uh, program. So especially on issues related to governance uh, issues. And uh, yeah, so thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hozakar. Uh, please ask, uh, have a round of applause for Professor Ronald. And again, it's very interesting uh, presentation, which kind of a different before uh, with the previous uh, speakers in which I think uh, that the presentation is kind of a more positive uh, 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 aspect in which we have a towards the development in where we have a, a seven or five uh, corridors. Uh, however, uh, in those uh, corridors, uh, uh, I, I was wondering why not uh, there's an, a corridor, uh, a development corridor in Papua, Professor Ronald. Maybe you can explain uh, a bit later on. Uh, uh, for this uh, 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 question and answer. However, uh, here uh, I'm uh, as the moderator and also the facilitator, so I have to uh, give the um, uh, the priority to the uh, audience uh, 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 on campus or also uh, online uh, that uh, watch this uh, uh, webinar of conference. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can see now uh, there's a number of uh, raised hand uh, online. But first, I would like to ask uh, uh, maybe the audience on campus uh, would like to ask directly to uh, the speakers. Maybe uh, the committee can uh, help me to identify the uh, uh, the participant who want to ask question on campus. No? Okay. Maybe I can uh, uh, continue with the audience uh, online. So I can, uh, here we have three um, uh, participants. Please state your name, yeah? And uh, briefly uh, address to whom the speakers that you would like to ask the question and uh, keep it brief, yeah? Uh, you can either use Bahasa or use uh, in English, uh, either way. Uh, I give to the floor to Tirza, Mariani Claudia. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Afrianza and all honorable speakers. Uh, actually, uh, oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Tirza. I am an undergraduate student uh, of Global Studies at Christian University of Indonesia. I have three questions, actually. Uh, one question for Mr. Deniswara and two questions for Mr. Hadrian. Uh, first to Mr. Deniswara, 
Mr. Lenny Suara, there was a ratification of uh, the ASEAN Agreement on E-Commerce, and it was held uh, last year in 2020. So I, will, I would like to ask uh, your opinion. Uh, will it be relevant to try off or uh, push the economics uh, with this ratification during a mid of the pandemic? And to Mr. Adrian, uh, thank you so much uh, about Uh, the index information about the index data. Uh, I, I actually, uh, it, it honestly remind me about the optimization of uh, uh, migrant workers in uh, in ASEAN countries or ASEAN society in here. So, Mr. Hadrian, uh, at the 36th uh, ASEAN summit on June 2020, uh, the meeting it was said that the ASEAN Economic Minister had adopted the Hanoi document. Action plan for strengthening ASEAN economic cooperation and supply chain connectivity in responding. Uh, it was said at the meeting to ensure the smooth flow of essential goods. Uh, again, I want to ask your op opinion. The first of optimization of uh, slavery. Uh, as we know, uh, based on the data you showed and based on your opinion uh, in ASEAN. It means uh, maybe I'm going to say like uh, the protection of migrant workers here. And second question: How can about to ensure the mute, uh, the smooth flow essential goods uh, can be ensured if indeed in a, con a condition that ASEAN countries uh, priority still uh, security here? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for your questions. And now. Um, um, Matthew Simbola. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, moderator. Uh, uh, sorry, Matthew, can you speak louder, please? Am I audible? Sorry? Yes, louder, please. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, moderator. Uh, I address my question to Professor Ronald. Uh, but before I address... Sorry, uh, Matthew, where are you from? Uh, yes, I'm from Bali. Hello. Okay. From Udayana University? No, I'm from uh, Uki, of course. Okay, <laughs> so, but you're in Bali now? Uh, yes. Okay, right. Uh, interpreter. Yes. Okay. Uh, before I ask my question to Professor uh, Ronald, I would like to say thank you that Um, uh, I've got a wonderful insight regarding on the correlation between human rights, SDGs, and international treaties. But I would like to ask that uh, during uh, Indonesia implementation regarding on the SDG itself, sometimes there is a disparity between each of uh, the, um, the aspects in the SDG itself. Like, let's say, for example, SDG number eight regarding on economic development is sometimes contrary to SDGs number 15, which is living in land, I mean, in the implementation, of course. Uh, let's take an example, uh, like in Kalimantan, where is sometimes indigen uh, indigenous people often marginalized due to the national development conducted by cooperation or by the government itself. So meaning that in order to create a harmonization between Uh, some international declarations such as United Nations declaration toward indigenous people uh, with uh, another SDGs. Uh, what is the best mechanism to harmonize uh, this aspect so that the development itself uh, shall not sacrifice a certain or particular member of the society? So I need your best solution and insight regarding on uh, how that SDGs can be fully applied and Uh, according to the fairness principle itself. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for your question. And uh, last question from Maria Serafin. Maria, are you there? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. By the way, thanks for Mr. Ari Afriansha as the moderator and all the enabled speaker in this online meeting. I have question and it's addressed to. Sorry, Maria, where are you from? Mr. I'm an undergraduate student at Low Faculty of Christian University of Indonesia. Okay, 
So this question is addressed to Mrs. Cecilia Jimenez. But first of all, I would like to thank and appreciate for your great presentation, Mrs. Cecilia Jimenez. And here my question is about Iraq's Yazidis. That is one of the example of IDP or internally displayed person. My question is, how is the effectiveness about the international law to give a protection for IRX Yazidis, especially to mention about sexual violence conflict there? And what is the obstacles for international law to maintain the such of problems? Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. But I'm not quite sure whether uh, Miss Cecilia is still here with us, but I'm sure the, the committee <laughs> We'll uh, 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 pass forward uh, uh, your question to Miss Cecilia. Okay, so we have the first round of the uh, question. Uh, first, we have a question from Tiza to uh, uh, Professor Daniswara and also uh, Hadrian. And I guess uh, we can start with uh, Pak Rector uh, to give your answer about the ASEAN e-commerce agreement and the relevance in the pandemic. Pak Rector? Uh, Dennis Wara, are you still here with us? Uh, okay, I think uh, maybe he's not uh, at uh, his uh, office right now. So we can continue to Professor Hadrian. Uh, the question in regards with the uh, ASEAN connectivity and your opinion about slavery in, in ASEAN and also relevancy to the migrant workers. Professor Hadrian. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you for the question. It's a uh, are good questions. Uh, at the moment, everything really actually difficult, right? So make it simple. Right? So when I heard your question and there is a word ensure that used there, and that is a, such a big word right at the moment, right? So there is a gap between what if you like, right, government official, right, if you like want to say, obviously, politically, they have to say something when they actually try to develop some kind of policy or collaboration, if you like. But in, in practice, without really actually strong really governance, and really strong really actually, if you like, uh, uh, rules of laws, obviously, things can just become really, basically like a, like a uh, lip service, if you like, right? Something that need to be done in terms of providing some kind of impressions that things are actually being done. But the reality is, is very complex, right? So even those countries that actually really have the, at the moment, right, modern slavery law, they don't actually have really power to implement the sanction yet. So they have law, right? They actually have set up now, if you like, like framework to monitor the process, right? They ask people uh, or sorry, organizations to uh, produce reports. At the moment, they actually just cover big companies anyway, right? Those big companies need to produce report. But even if they don't produce report, even if they don't actually produce report properly, the sanctions are really vague, right? So uh, Australian government, for example, right? They actually try to name and shame. Right? So the strategy is really actually not really putting really sanction in terms of fine, right, or more over criminal, like criminal sanction, but it's actually name and shame. So they think it's actually work better than the real sanction in terms of fine or, or restriction. So I guess without really actually collaborative work from people, from a lot of people in terms of really actually uh, do more, if you like, uh, negotiation, if you like, Right, in terms of how this modern slavery must be actually tackled. All issues that you mentioned is really actually at the moment, it's really complex to even actually provide answers. Right, so, so it's a task for everyone to really actually make sure that the awareness level actually become higher and then try to basically utilize things that have been developed now, right? Like SDGs, like those actually a policy or protocols from ILO then make sure that we use them and promote them well, right? Otherwise, at the moment, right, we can just say that the word ensure is, shouldn't actually be used. It's probably such a big word that, that actually the, pro, the implementation of it is really actually difficult, right? That's my, my, my view on this, right? Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adrian. Uh, Professor Halzaker, the question about the disparity in uh, SDG goal uh, among themselves and how it relates to Indonesia. Yes, uh, Matthew, thank you uh, very much uh, for that uh, question. Um, you're very lucky to be on Bali uh, right now. Um, if I had to be on lockdown anywhere, I think uh, Bali would be one of my first choices. Um, you know, last year, one of my uh, PhD candidates, uh, Lakshmi Kazumawati uh, from Bali, uh, just finished and she wrote about inclusive uh, growth and her empirical research was really about the hotel industry on uh, Bali and this sort of uh, balance between the interests of the big hotels and the employees um, uh, and the international uh, tourists and, and the local population. Um, so um, yeah, so we have had good PhD candidates from Bali and would al always good to have new master and PhD candidates. Um, you talked about the um, Sustainable Development Goal implementation and the sort of disparities. You mentioned SDG 8 on economic development and how that kind of economic development might hurt goals like SDG 15, which is the environmental goal of protecting life on land. And you know, what's interesting about the SDG is the government gets to select what their priorities are and they decide how to balance those in setting their targets and their indicators. You mentioned then, you know, the issue of this kind of economic development can really be harmful for indigenous uh, people and also on the resources that they are dependent on. Um, and here is where the human rights law and the human rights protections are much stronger. Um, the, in the, the human rights idea is all human rights are equal, they are universal, and it gives you mechanisms to, uh, to try to fight back. Um, so, that's an, an example of there are these sort of various agendas but that the human rights based in law and the rights then of individuals to try to, uh, but it still of course is very difficult and especially for indigenous uh, groups, it's very difficult. And um, you know, one has to work with um, civil society organizations and try to reach up also to international um, uh, groups, um, to help put pressure back on. One has to use national mechanisms, perhaps like Komnis Ham, the anti-discrimination body at the, the national level. Um, so it really underscores sort of the thing I talked about at the first part of the presentation about these difference between SDGs and how they're constructed and voluntary national reviews compared to human rights, which are much uh, more uh, developed with uh, legal protections. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Ronald. So um, again, the, 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 the answer is really uh, clear and uh, really explained about the uh, questions. Uh, I now open the second round uh, of the uh, uh, question and answer. Now, uh, I would like to uh, invite again uh, from the participants, uh, from the audience online or also on campus. Maybe uh, if you have uh, uh, some questions for the speakers. Okay, uh, I, I haven't uh, seen any question from the chat box as well, yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, in the meantime, uh, I take the liberty uh, to ask question uh, to Professor uh, Hadrian, uh, in which that uh, in terms of the global change that we we seen that Indonesia as one of the places, one of the place uh, to put the factories uh, and also the manufacturers from all over the world. How can we ensure that the parent company from outside Indonesia? Uh, be aware that what's happening on the ground in Indonesia to uh, ensure the protection of uh, human rights. 
and for Professor uh, Ronald, my question uh, uh, just now about why there's no uh, corridor uh, be being built in uh, Papua. Thank you, friends. Professor Hadrian. So thank thank you very much, right? So Ari, so I heard another two or three words of ensure that right? you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so when so, so when I am actually really actually at the moment, right? The reality is that it's there is such no such thing as ensure, right? In this in this era of modern slavery, right? Because the the practice is so cunning, right? So and then the reality is that. Uh, those actually involved, if you are affected if you like, by modern slavery, are also participants themselves, right? Not really voluntarily, right? Probably involuntarily, because mostly economic necessity. So if they actually really actually need the job, right? Need really actually to get some income, then they got no other choice. Obviously, they actually don't report them. So all of this rely a lot on reporting. Right. And then obviously the participations of uh, worker unions, for example, in terms of helping this worker to uh, to basically be open in terms of what's actually the experience. So what the companies overseas actually can, uh, if you like, do is obviously to do obviously a lot of monitoring process. But even with that, obviously, the effect would be very, 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 very low or very, very limited if really there is no really also support system come from the government. Right? So it, it is a very complex situation at the moment. That's why I believe that there are not many come or even countries that really actually want to go into these modern slavery issues too much because they understand the difficulty on this. But it's something that hopefully can be gradually improved right by this uh, uh, efforts by, by many people, including the SDGs, because ADGs has actually covered a lot of aspects of human right, as, uh, welfare, if you like, and that's modern slavery is one of them that is, that is covered. Right? So I agree with Ron, if we, if we basically look at and utilize right, SDGs right, as well as possible, we can actually cover a lot of aspects within uh, our society. Thank All right, you. thank you very much, uh, Professor Hadrian. Professor Ronald? Yes, Dr. Ari, thank you for your uh, question. And um, indeed, you know, some of our research uh, at our Seasian Center has focused on um, uh, Papua. One of our PhD candidates is uh, from Papua, um, uh, Petrus Farnaboon. And uh, one of my other uh, candidates that now is back in the home ministry, uh, Tri Arfandi, and his work has been uh, in Papua on um, access to uh, educational services and um, uh, healthcare and uh, water and in a multi-level perspective. This particular uh, research proposal is to the Dutch NWO and RISTEC Indonesia. And, um, you know, my U Indonesia partners are um, uh, University of Indonesia, ITB, and Gajamada, and um, they selected um, corridors. And we originally had four, and we pushed it to five, but there really wasn't funding to go uh, beyond that. But um, they really selected corridors based on some of their prior uh, work, and uh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your explanation. And we do have a last question, though, on, on the chat box. I think it's relevant to both uh, Professor Hadri and Professor Ronald. Uh, from Aldoni, uh, how is the commitment of human rights in handling the existing monopoly? Of course, we all understand that in most regions, especially in Indonesia, each region has companies and is affiliated with external organization that agrees on something. Isn't it a form of monopoly and result is inequality of respect for workers? Professor Hadrian, your comments? Okay. Well, it, it is it is interesting to it's an interesting question, uh, but my 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 view is that right uh, affiliation is a normal thing, right? It's something that actually does exist and actually should exist, right? In today's environment, especially, right? Collaboration should be actually everyone. So I don't really understand probably the question well, because I don't think that affiliations lead to monopoly. So uh, if Aldoni is here, then probably one explains a bit more why he thinks that 
this kind of affiliations lead to monopoly. I'll be happy to hear probably more explanation. So I probably don't right. really understand the question or the essence of the question. All right. So let's uh, invite Aldoni. Are you here? Can you uh, uh, speak directly to us? Uh, Aldoni? No, I, I don't think uh, maybe <laughs> trouble with the... With the so uh, I'll, I'll don't you can contact me and probably we can have a chat a bit more. Yes, right? yes, so that would be a good idea. I'm happy with that. Right. Uh, Professor Ronald, do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, thank you. A, a, a short comment. You know, I think that the, the trend that we've seen of um, that businesses should also um, uh, be respecting human rights, and that's been a developing uh, field that um, multi national companies and other companies should have um, uh, plans to respect human rights, I think is important. And, you know, we've also seen a trend that some companies will uh, show how they are trying to make contributions toward the um, meeting the sustainable development goals. So I, for example, was looking through a brochure that a hotel chain based in Bangkok had for all of their uh, hotels, for example, on trying to reduce water usage so that there would be more for uh, local citizens. Um, and uh, in terms of education, they talked about training programs that they would do for um, uh, local uh, employees. So I think this trend of making sure that businesses are engaged and thinking about the implications of their enterprise in terms of human rights and the sustainable development goals is important. And that's uh, obviously also in the Professor Hadrian's comments about that the businesses have to make sure that their supply chains do not have modern slavery involved is consistent with this. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ronald, for your question. I guess, uh, oh, there's another one, uh, Reshan. I think this it will be the last one. Yeah. Kevin, please uh, state uh, where you're from. Kevin Jonathan, you can now you can unmute yourself and turn on your video. I boleh saya pakai bahasa Indonesia aja, Pak? Yes, that's fine. Untuk videonya saya nggak bisa nyalain ini saya lagi ada di tempat yang tidak memungkinkan menyalakan video. Oke, okay, that's fine, Kevin. Your question and where are you from? Saya dari Fakultas Hukum UKI. Saya ingin bertanya ke Profesor Hadrian. Menurut Profesor Hadrian sendiri dari penjelasan yang tadi Profesor Hadrian sudah berikan, hanya ada empat negara dari negara-negara industri maju di dunia yang tergabung dalam G20 ataupun G7 yang mengatur mengenai pelarangan uh, atau membuka transparansi gitu terhadap praktik per perbudakan modern ini. Menurut Profesor Hadrian sendiri, apa yang menghambat negara-negara lainnya untuk memberikan pengaturan serupa? Apakah memang harus sebegitunya kebijakan negara terhadap praktik perbudakan modern ini dilegalisasi secara tersirat sehingga bisa mendatangkan investasi yang banyak dan memberikan pemasukan terhadap negara? Atau seperti apa gitu? Saya ingin tahu apa hal-hal menurut Profesor Hadrian yang menghambat negara-negara lainnya untuk memperlakukan peraturan serupa mengingat hak-hak asasi manusia daripada buruh pabrik ini atau para pekerja pabrik ini merupakan suatu hal yang sangat fundamental yang harus diatur sebagaimana diatur di konvensi-konvensi PBB dan sebagainya. Terima kasih. Alright, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Despite that in bahasa, I think Prof. Hadrian uh, understand the question. And I think Ro uh, Ronald also understand as well, I think. Uh, okay. Professor Hadrian, your comments or your answer? Okay, but so there, there are a few reasons for that. Right? First, first reason is that obviously there are resistance in terms of creating new acts or new laws. Right? Some legislators, if you like, think that they, the, the issue of human rights, the issue of you know, slavery, right? There are really common issues that have been covered in the existing laws or legislation. That's one thing. Uh, so in the in the political debate in terms of what the necessity of new or specific laws into into modern slavery, obviously people or uh, 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 countries actually got their own, if you like, opinions about about that. And, and secondly. I guess the, the understanding of the issue within the context of modern slavery is still complex as well. 
So when, when legislation was made, law is actually developed, there are obviously aspects of sanction that supposedly involve in that, right? What is, otherwise it will be missing something in the process. And that's something that is still difficult to, de to deal with, right? So even at the moment, and then the monitoring process is also very difficult. And the scope of the legislation of the law itself, at the moment, even the four countries, not even four, right? Three countries plus California, if you like, they still limit the, the implication of the laws into really actually just big companies. So it is quite complex issue at the moment. So the resistance of really actually producing or creating new law focusing on modern slavery, it does exist. Uh, now in developing countries, especially those countries that are sensitive to modern slavery, that's even more, even, more, even worse, right? So that's even more difficult because this, the, the effect of really actually producing modern slavery, right, when they actually need collaboration with developed country, that role is obviously politically are, are still not favorable probably for some, right? For some other, yes, obviously in principle, no one's like to see right, modern slavery, but in practice, obviously there are a lot of uh, needs, right, if you like, and goals of uh, people and parties and institutions that need to be catered for. And that makes things really, really complex at this stage. Right. All right, thank you very much. Yes, the question, Kevin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hadrian. And I, I think uh, Kevin has got a very comprehensive uh, answer from Professor Hadrian. Okay, um, Professor Hadrian, Professor uh, Ronald, and maybe uh, Pak Rector, I think we're approaching the end of this uh, session. Uh, I guess uh, so many uh, questions, so many uh, comments uh, still wish to be discussed uh, in this uh, 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 event. However, because of the time limitation, we have to end here. And maybe uh, in the future, we can uh, again meet uh, uh, in person after the pandemic, of course, and hopefully we can discuss in further uh, elaboration. Again, uh, please give a round of applause for uh, Professor Hadrian and Professor uh, Ronald for the uh, excellent uh, presentation and, and, and explanation. Uh, from me, the moderator, uh, I would like to give the uh, session back to Master of Ceremony, Mr. Herto, and my apologies for any inconvenience, and thank you very much for your uh, attendance for this session. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much to our moderator today, Dr. Ari Afriansa, for leading us in a panel session with the honorable invited speakers. I believe that each and every one of us must have gotten so many beneficial information and sharing of ideas that we can bring home and implement in our daily lives. I mean, that's the goal of our international conference. And yeah, um, we are so happy because we have finished the Panel session, please give it up for our International Conference on Law and Human Rights, ICLHR 2021, with the theme ASEAN Diversities and its Principles Toward ASEAN Legal Integration in Pandemic Era. This is organized by the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, in collaboration with Han Seidel Foundation and Ministry of Law and Human Rights of the Republic of Indonesia, co-organized by Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan and Universitas Jayabaya. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have completed the two days plenary sessions and parallel sessions, it's time for us to listen to the conclusion statement from the first International Conference on Law and Human Rights, ICLHR 2021. Please welcome Dr. Henry J. Pandiangan, SHMH. <laughs> Thank you uh, to Master Ceremony. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, 
nama budaya, salam kebajikan, shalom. My Excellencies, our Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia Jakarta and the end Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia Jakarta and my Honorable Resident Representative of Hans Seidel Foundation and all speakers and participants. Thank you to God who is almighty because of his love and grace this first conference could be carried well. And thank you also for the support from the Rector of Universitas Christian Indonesia Jakarta, the Dean of the Law Faculty of Universitas Christian Indonesia Jakarta, and Colleges, Hans Seidel Foundation, Universitas Jayabaya, Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan, and for best support so that this event can be carried out well do. Okay, thank you very much to the speakers, presenters, and seminar participants who have faithfully attended even after even for yesterday, who an active role in carrying out this seminar. Thanks also to all committees, UKI TV, multimedia operators, and other parties involved for this hard work so that this event runs well. It is an honor for us. This first international conference can be carried well. This is a proof that even in the condition of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is not obstacle for us to move forward and to be a productive. This conference is the first step and the great momentum for us that we can move forward and uh, in the future we will become university that has international accreditation. Okay, es thank you. Especially the law faculty. To achieve this, to achieve this, we cannot work alone. We need support from all parties, especially those who support this conference. Conference of law and human rights are indeed a global issue that is fun to discuss. But each discussion, there are many interesting things to discuss about law related to human rights. We already discussed issue, start from the issue today is Myanmar crisis, labor, policy and economic strategies to handle COVID-19 pandemic, especially ASEAN area. I remember that the one of speakers said, each impact of the COVID-19 is a child climb the tree to find Wi-Fi signal for online school and other issue. According to that discussion, we get basic idea that can be implemented to the development of law and human rights in each country. That is our panel remarks. If there are uh, deficiencies and mistakes in the seminar, we apologize profusely. Thank you for the kind attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi Om Santi Namo Buddhaya. Salam kebajikan. Shalom. Thank you, Dr. Pandiangan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, closing speech from Dean of Law Faculty of Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Please welcome Dr. Hulman Panjaitan, SHMH. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nama budaya Salam kebajikan dan salam Faculty of Law Universitas Kristen Indonesia Who collaborate with Hans Seidel Foundation 
and Ministry of Law and Human Rights, Republic of Indonesia as partner, Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan, and Universitas Jayabaya as co-organizer to hold first international conference on law and human rights with the theme ASEAN Diversities and its principle toward ASEAN legal integration in pandemic area. This event going on along two days on April 14 and 15, 20 and 21, which contribute by the number of participants as much as 600 presented by amounts of 113 moderator as much as 14 with taking many topics such as economic law, civil law, public policy and politics, human rights, international law, health law, criminal law on behalf of collaboration and co-organize. This event throughout virtual one line, online by Zoom and live streaming, YouTube, namely Fakultas Hukum Universitas Kristen Indonesia, has been published in media such as TPRI, TPL Sinta, TV Nusantara, media online, and magazine online Gatra, and other media. The committees are hoping this event can be accomplished back with the topic more interesting and actual. The end of this statement, the, the, the end of this statement, I would like to say many thanks and health greeting in pandemic era. Thank you very much to Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Dr. Hulman Panjaitan, SHMH. Once again, give it up for our international <laughs> conference on law and human rights, ICLHR 2021. This is the first and due to COVID-19 pandemic, we have to keep a safe distance uh, in order to stay safe and avoid physical contact. Therefore, we will do the handover of certificates virtually on screen. I will uh, try to guide you. Uh, the committee will display on screen the names of the representative of the roles that, that I will uh, mention. The first one, the symbolic handover certificate will be given to His Excellency Professor Yasona Lauli, MSc, PhD, as our keynote speaker. Yes. And we are also giving the certificate to invited speaker, Dr. Daniswara K. Haryono, SHMH, MBA. And as the representative of the moderators, to Miss Jessica Vincencia Marpaung. Yep. For presenter, Mariano. For the representative of participant, Ayu Iza Elfani. And for the committee, the representative will be Lona Johannes Lengkong. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for us to recognize the best presenters in the first ICLHR Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia 2021. The best presenter, Mahrus Ali from Universitas Islam Indonesia, Yogyakarta. Congratulations. And Angela Johanna Hutagalung from Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Jakarta. 
the third one for the best presenter, Esther Loisa Angelia Simanjuntak from Universitas Prima Indonesia, Medan. The fourth one, Indah Pangestu Amarita Sari from Universitas Bayangkara, Jakarta Raya. And the last but not the least, Mariani from Universitas Prima Indonesia, Medan. And we're also going to recognize the best paper first ICLHR Faculty of Law Universitas Kristen Indonesia 2021. I will read uh, in order from the top one to the last one. The best paper with the title Reflection of ASEAN Charter Principles by the Indonesian Government in Handling Protracted Armed Violence in Papua by Arlina Permanasari from Universitas Trisakti, Jakarta. And the second best paper with the title Human Rights Perspective in the Indonesian Policy Concerning High-Scale Social Restraint in Pandemic Era by Erlina Maria C. Sinaga and Mary Christina, I mean Mary Christian Putri from Mahkamah Konstitusi Republik Indonesia. And the third one with the title Criticizing Indonesian Initiatives in the Junta Military Coup d'etat in Myanmar, a study of political communication by Kontina Siahaan and Osbin Samosir from Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Next, number four, two decades of Indonesian Ranham in Reformation Era 1998 to 2019, the domestic institutionalized, sorry, the domestic Institutionalization of Human Rights by Mahda El Muhtaj, Universitas Sumatra Utara. Excuse me for my mispronunciation. And number five, Indonesian role on formulating association of Southeast Asian nations treaty regarding on health protection toward global pandemic by Putu George Matthew Simbolon from Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Congratulations once again to those who have gotten the best paper on the first ICLHR Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen, Indonesia. Give it up once again. <laughs> Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope uh, we're not tired of giving up because we are so excited. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. And if yesterday we witnessed the beauty of dance from Betawi as home to multicultural students in Indonesia. We are so proud now to take you, ladies and gentlemen, to embark on a trip to Eastern Indonesia with the beauty of Mambo, Dan Mambo Simbo Dance from Papua. <laughs> Woo!
To lead us in the closing prayer, I would like to invite Miss Jessica Vincencia Marpaung, SH LLM. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let us pray to God Almighty to close this international conference on law and human rights. Kindly allow me to lead in Christian faith, and if you may, please pray along according to your faith and belief. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for a successful and fruitful two days conference of international law and human rights, especially in the context of ASEAN and ultimately our beloved Indonesia. We pray that all the knowledge and experience as well as connection gained through this conference will be used by each of us to glorify your name. We pray for all participants, speakers and committee that after this conference, we are blessed only by your grace, strength and spirit to contribute to Indonesia, ASEAN and all communities we are a part of. We especially pray for especially the ASEAN state members amidst the pandemic so that all nations may continue to recuperate politically, socially, and economically to flourish together eventually. In your name, Lord, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Miss uh, Jessica Vincencia Morpaung. And before we dismiss, ladies and gentlemen, this is also an important thing to do. We have to have a photo session. Even though it's virtual, uh, I would like to invite all of us in Zoom room to open your camera so that the committee will be able to take a screenshot and then later on it will be used as documentation and hopefully it can appear on next year's calendar. Okay, on my count. As we have uh, many layers of uh, rooms, uh, so I hope uh, you don't mind to bear with me for uh, for a while. I would I will on my count. Okay, one for for the first layer, one, two, three. Okay, please give your best smile. Next layer, one, two, three. Okay, some are still uh, loading. Okay, the next layer, please. One, two, three. Okay, I see beautiful faces there. Again, the next layer. One, two, three. Yep, next layer. One, two, three, okay, next one, okay, this layer seems not to have uh, any open camera here, okay, we move to next layer, I think that's it, okay, okay, thank you so much again, <laughs> yep, thank you so much for the beautiful faces that uh, still stick with us until this uh, very late in the afternoon well ladies and gentlemen we have come to the end of the first international conference on law and human rights iclh air 21. yep the theme for this first international conference on law and human rights again is about ASEAN diversities and its principles toward ASEAN legal integration in pandemic era. And this very first international conference is organized by the Faculty of Law, Universitas Kristen Indonesia. Give it up for Faculty of Law. Yep. In, in collaboration with Hans Seidel Foundation and Ministry of Law and Human Rights, Republic of Indonesia co-organized by Universitas Prima Indonesia Medan and Universitas Jayabaya. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, attention, and contribution to this conference. On behalf of the Working Committee, we would like to apologize for any inconveniences you might experience during the program. I am Meher Tobastian Abul signing off. Thank you and see you next year on the second international conference on law and human rights. God bless.